are now in public session and advise members uh, that uh, despite the public gallery being closed, we are indeed now in public session. And ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all of the members into the spotlight for the next four items. Uh, and advise members that you're in the spotlight and that you uh, might want to mute your devices. Clark, agenda item one, any apologies? None, I think we're here. Okay, agenda item two then members is chairperson's business. Can I advise members that the Scottish Government has announced uh, that owing to the disruption to the provision of education in schools during COVID-19 that there will be no advanced or higher examinations in Scotland in 2021. Grades will instead be awarded based on teacher judgment. Can I remind members that externally set and externally marked assessments delivered in school will also replace exams in Wales, while in England A-levels and GCSE exams will be undertaken but with reduced assessment specifications and reduced marking regimes. Can I uh, seek the committee's view uh, on the department approach, which is based on reduced exam specification for GCSE and limited changes to practicals for A2 le level examinations. Uh, this is obviously something that we will be asking the minister about today, but do members wish yeah. to say anything at this stage? Yeah, um, Daniel? I think the suggestion is very, very concerning, Chair, uh, as I'm sure the rest of you have, uh, as well as I have, been engaging with schools and teachers and principals, and the stress levels are through the roof, anxiety levels are quite significant. Um, th there is a very clear uh, uh, belief in all of our schools, amongst our young people and our teachers, that GCSE examinations and A-levels should be cancelled this year. Um, a huge amount of discussion around GCSE in particular, given the range of uh, subject areas and topics and also given how COVID has impacted on our children's education and how isolation continues to affect uh, the operation of schools and teaching within the school environment. Uh, I don't think it is enough uh, that the uh, Minister simply uh, go compare uh, with other areas in relation to exams and dig his heels in, which is very unhelpful and adding considerable uh, stress to an already very difficult situation. Exams need to be cancelled this year. They need to be cancelled for GCSE and they need to be cancelled for A-level and AS-level. Uh, and it's up to the Minister to do that. I've had conversations with SIA, I've had conversations with the Children and Young Persons Commissioner, with the Mental Health Champion, and there's been a, a huge concern in relation to the agenda that, that the Minister is going on. He doesn't seem to be listening to the advice of anybody in relation to this, and it has given me serious concern that we're headed for a similar situation, if not much worse, uh, to that that we witnessed in the summer, which let a lot of young people down and devastated quite a lot of young people in terms of their uh, opportunities for the future. So they have to be cancelled. I, I, I okay. don't think there's any other option. Okay. Any other members wish to comment at this stage or content to direct questions to the Minister on that subject during in the briefing? Yep. Okay, members. Agenda item 2.2, trends in international maths and science study. Can I advise members uh, that the Deputy Chairperson and I met informally with Department of Education officials on the 8th of December in order to receive a briefing on findings for the Northern Ireland uh, results of the trends in international maths and science study. The TIM study provides a snapshot assessment of science and maths education at Primary 6 and shows how Northern Ireland compares with other jurisdictions. A fuller report has now been published by the Department of Education. The report shows good results for maths. Uh, previous international reports show that at post-primary results can vary significantly according to socio-economic background and I would suggest that a more longitudinal study of a representative pupil cohort is required uh, to really interrogate that differential of results. Um, the, the, the briefing um, and the questions from the Minister uh, on the floor of the Assembly yesterday um, suggested uh, that progress had been made with regards to attainment gap between uh, most affluent uh, and pupils with uh, disadvantage. Um, I think that means in terms of comparisons to other countries, um, as regrettably the, the findings were that um, in, in both mathematics and science, there was a significant differentiation in achievement between pupils uh, in schools categorised as most affluent and pupils with disadvantage. So I think there is still work to be done on that regard. 
but right to record the uh, the attainment levels for for maths in particular and and how well Northern Ireland uh, performs um, educationally in comparison um, with countries right across the rest of the world. Um, are we members uh, content to issue the press release which has been tabled? Um, you might not have had a chance to glance at that just yet, so I could return to that in AOB if you if you haven't. Would that be appropriate, Clark? Are members content to agree? Yeah, ju just on that, uh, here, yeah. uh, like, I, I think this is hugely significant, uh, sixth in the world in relation to uh, maths uh, for young people is a very, very strong uh, representation of the quality of uh, our young people and their their achievements, and I think that in our schools as well. Uh, and I think that uh, we we should congratulate uh, wholly uh, our young people and absolutely our schools and teachers uh, in relation to that very significant achievement. It's, it's for a small small, small place like this, it uh, it is um, it's hugely significant. Uh, I was very very delighted to see it. Agreed. Um, the, the the press release is obviously to do that as well. Um, Recognise that once again, um, school primary school pupils, teaching staff, school leaders have have shown that they're amongst the very best in the world. Um, if members want to have a glance at that press release and maybe return to it today, will be just to sign it off. Is that the best approach, Clark? Are you yep. done with that? Yep. Okay, members. Can, can uh, I just ask? Yes, you, Peter. Uh, or in, sorry, Ron. In terms of the. Um, uh, specialist team that the Minister has established to address underachievement um, and obviously there is an indication that that gap is whilst it's narrowing it's, it needs to narrow even even more and are the specialist team actually establishing uh, you know, being made aware of this within this report and uh, something they will address Chairperson, that's in the terms of reference um, of the uh, specialist team that they're going to look at international studies, and I imagine they would look at the most recent and the uh, most comprehensive, which is which is Tim's. So uh, yeah. yeah, they'll be taking that into account. Yeah. I would anticipate. Yeah. Okay. 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 Members also content to arrange a formal briefing with the department on the study. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. That's great. Okay. Uh, Two point three is was our informal committee event um, with regards to vulnerable children. Can I remind members that the committee undertook an informal Zoom stakeholder engagement event on Thursday, the third of December, with stakeholders on issues relating to special educational needs and access to support for vulnerable children. A written note of the feedback from stakeholders has been tabled. Can I seek the committee's agreement to circulate the note to participants for comment? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Can I also seek the committee's agreement to consider the way forward for this subject? It, for example, uh, a committee motion uh, at next week's meeting. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Can I also uh, seek committee's views on undertaking more Zoom events of this kind uh, and ask members to indicate what subjects they would like these events to be based on? For example, emotional health and wellbeing framework, or perhaps more urgently, examinations. Um, members wish to suggest yeah, sure. that... Emotional mental health and uh, wellbeing framework is, is, is vital, yeah. Okay, right. I'll note that. If, if members um, want to have a think about what other um, themes we would do well to cover, um, perhaps you could bring that forward next week when we're considering what action to take further to our, our last event. Members agree? Yeah. I just right. want to just to say it was a um, really excellent event. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. I know it was lit on it. Um, and also to commend the assembly staff. It was so well organised and well run. Uh, I, I go on to many of Zooms and we, we can't stay in the same room. We all disappear. So it was excellent. So well done, everybody, for your hard work on that as well. So I think it definitely is a good way forward. Um, whilst we can't bring people in and meet them in rooms. So I would agree. Yep. I agree. Thank you, Karen. Um, Mr. Chair, can I make a point? Yes, Mars. Uh, the, the, the notification for the meeting arrived. Uh, uh, I didn't see it until it was It's an old football address, Tullum's uh, 67 at Yahoo. The, the, the details were sent to that. It's just make sure that nothing is sent to that email again, because that's, that's the football club's email. Okay, we'll get, we'll get that admin sorted for you with the clerk, Morris. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, yeah. thank you. Uh, 2.4, can I seek the committee agreement that uh, in order to enhance committee communications, uh, we will meet regularly with, uh, that I will meet regularly with the Assembly communications team and continue to seek committee's agreement for any committee communications. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Can I refer members then to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 2nd of December, page 6, and seek members' agreement that they are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, there are no matters arising, so we can move to agenda item 5, our ministerial briefing on COVID-19 response issues. And can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and add the witnesses uh, to the meeting? Can I refer members to a cover note from Committee Clerk at page 14? Correspondence from the Minister on the New Child Care Sustainability Fund at page 24. The Pupil and Workforce Attendance Survey for 1st of December 2020 at page 31. Correspondence on restart issues, examinations, contingency planning and guidance for schools from page 35. Letters from schools at page 112. And uh, questions for the Minister from the Equality Coalition at page 120. There's also a copy of the letter to schools on Christmas closure or lack thereof, uh, from the Minister in tabled items. Can I welcome then Peter Weir, MLA, Minister of Education, and the following officials, Gary Fair, Finance Director, Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing, James Hutchinson, Restart Director, and Karen McCulloch, Director of Curriculum Qualification and Standards. By way of welcome, can I say we're glad uh, to have you at the committee today to answer questions and provide an update on a, a number of extremely important and urgent issues um, relating to the work of the Department of Education and the COVID-19 pandemic impact. Um, can I advise the Minister and, and officials that the session will be reported by Hansard and invite the Education Minister to provide us with a, a brief opening statement before taking questions from the members. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the, the committee. And obviously, as you've already introduced the, the team that are around us, I'll, I'll not um, take time up with, with mentioning uh, or introducing any of them. Again, I think you're all familiar with them. So thank you for the opportunity for this uh, opportunity for briefing, I suppose particularly uh, on a wide range of issues facing the educational sector. I suppose when our schools reopened in August, um, I think there were some people who were uncertain whether that was the right thing to do. But I think with the hard work and professionalism, I think of our dedicated school workforce, and indeed also the contribution of parents, uh, we've achieved an awful lot during that period. Uh, and it's undoubtedly the case that children across Northern Ireland have benefited from that face-to-face -face return to school. Now, the pandemic has impacted on all our children and young people, but particularly vulnerable and disadvantaged children. So many children with disabilities and complex needs receive therapies and support while they are physically in school. And we know that many of these families have been struggling during the pandemic. And indeed, the, the benefits of routine and the protection that school brings. As we reopened in August, I think it was obvious to everybody that there was going to be challenges. And from conversations that I have with school leaders, it's clear that they've dealt with a wide range of difficult and exceptional circumstances. So I want publicly uh, in this forum to thank principals, teachers and school support staff who've met these challenges with calm, and resolved determination. And thanks to uh, their efforts, uh, our children have been able to return to school. Turning to the issue of both of curriculum and remote learning, during the continued, uh, continued impact of the pandemic, we've asked all schools to have contingency plans in place to deliver remote learning in the event of either a school closure or that uh, more frequently that a class or group of pupils need to self-isolate. Uh, while in theory the power was there to do it, we've not gone down the route of a mandatory or legal approach. And I don't want to place any sort of additional legal burden on our schools. And I believe that we're in the space that we don't need to. Feedback from our inspectorate indicates that all schools um, they've surveyed have contingency plans in place, and the majority have enacted them at some point. Schools vary significantly in context. What works in one type of school even in one area, may not be suitable for other kinds of schools. So my prior key priority is to keep our children in school wherever and whenever possible, but to support and empower schools to deliver uh, high-quality remote learning when it's required. 
My department has provided detailed guidance for schools for both remote learning and curriculum planning in 2021. Further guidance materials and case studies have also been produced by my department's continuity of learning project. The EA has developed a menu of online teacher professional learning uh, sessions, particularly focused on remote learning and also mental health and well-being. Uh, last week, all schools were provided with a checklist of readiness for remote learning. EA and CCMS have developed this in conjunction with principals to support uh, schools to plan and reflect on their remote learning, uh, what they have in place and the key areas of development. In order to support schools, I have relaxed a range of other statutory requirements, for example, in relation to school development planning to reduce the bureaucratic burden and free up time for curriculum planning. We're fortunate in Northern Ireland that schools have access to centrally provided um, IT system C2K. That's not something which has been available in a number of other jurisdictions. This has supported online access to school services from the beginning of COVID school closures. In recent months, additional funding has been provided to continue to improve the services available, including additional learning applications and up, uh, upgrading bandwidth. My department's uh, scheme to provide IT and Wi-Fi uh, access uh, to our education disadvantaged and vulnerable learners has distributed almost 10,000 devices and remains open to, uh, for new applications. The Northern Ireland curriculum is designed to have uh, limited legal uh, prescription, guide, giving schools as much flexibility as possible uh, what they choose to teach, for how long and how often, and it allows schools to use approaches that best suit their, uh, their pupils. This means that we don't need to spend or disapply our curriculum when schools reopened. Rather, we've helped empower schools to know uh, that they have the freedom with the minimum entitlement to the statutory curriculum to develop content they believe it's best for their, their pupils within their own school community and environment at this particular time. School leaders and, and teachers can use knowledge and professional expertise to adapt original plans and uh, practice to suit their own unique circumstances. Our key messages across the system is that the aim for this year is to support students to be motivated to learn and towards uh, becoming skilled and independent learners. We've also stressed the key importance of ensuring children have good emotional health and well-being, are engaged and motivated to learn and have the tools and skills they require for learning. Coping with the high level of uncertainty and change presented by COVID requires adaptability and psychological resilience. This has under, uh, underlined the key importance of the whole curriculum, thinking skills and personal uh, capabilities at the heart of the Northern Ireland curriculum. In the rapidly changing environment of the 21st century, an emphasis on skills uh, for an unpredictable world, such as communication, collaboration, informed decision-making, uh, creative problem-solving, adaptability, alongside empathy and emotional intelligence is vital. At the same time, school, my department has, has supported schools with additional funding, uh, such as the Engage programme to provide additional teaching support and a mental health and wellbeing fund scheme to provide um, laptops, other digital, and also the scheme to provide laptops and digital devices to our most vulnerable uh, learners. The Engage programme of 12 million uh, is providing that, that help to primary and post-primary. And the programme is delivering child-centred one-to-one -one small group or team teaching support by qualified teachers uh, to pupils who require additional support to re-engage when learning. Turning, I suppose, to the, the important issue of public examinations, uh, I believe that the experience of 2020 has shown that exams remain the fairest method of assessing and awarding qualifications. We saw right across the UK, indeed much of Western Europe, that despite every effort and good intention, other forms of assessment are likely to be more inequitable. We know from research that, for example, that non-examination assessment can be subject to bias, with the result that bright disadvantaged uh, students or students with special edu educational needs suffer the most. My priority, therefore, is to ensure that public examinations go ahead. I also believe it's extremely important that following the cancellation of examinations last summer, young people are given the opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge and skills through the examination process. Exams are the best way of giving young people the opportunity to show uh, what they can do and why it's so important uh, that they take place next summer. I've already engaged significant, uh, already agreed significant changes to CCA qualifications, making a range of public health adaptations to ensure 
safe delivery and reducing the number of exams pupils will need to take. These measures set out earlier in the academic year have uh, offered a sensible and pragmatic route through the initial wake of uh, COVID disruption. However, I'm considering a range of further contingency arrangements and mitigations, which will take account of the ongoing disruption. I've received advice from SIA, and my officials are discussing potential options with school leaders before final decisions are made, and I would hope to be in a position to make an announcement early next week on that. I'm considering both adjustments for individual candidates to take account of differences in the lost face-to-face -face teaching uh, time, and also wider systems-wide adjustments to qualifications to reduce the assessment burden for all our young people. Contingency arrangements will also be required to cover all eventualities in case exams uh, are missed during the summer. However, I want to make it clear I will not be cancelling examinations. While Wales and Scotland have cancelled uh, some public, uh, public examinations, it now appears that in Wales, young people will face externally set, I think as you highlighted yourself, externally set examinations, and these will be taken earlier than usual. There's a high degree of uncertainty across the Welsh system about what will happen. And while I'm reluctant to criticise in other jurisdictions, concerns are emerging about the lack of clarity on what the classroom teaching proposed will involve, how families uh, will be, uh, will be, or how fairness sorry, will be ensured, uh, why the tests are held so early in the school year uh, when pupils have missed so much education, and also whether English universities in particular will treat A-level, Welsh A-level students on a par with their English and Northern Irish counterparts. Most examinations have been honed and perfected over many years. During a pandemic, the Welsh Government have chosen to start a completely new system from scratch. No pass papers to help people, no mark schemes, and pupils are very unclear as to what to expect. Therefore, while on the face of simply, of the face of it, simply cancelling examinations would seem to some to be a good uh, approach, I do not believe it's the right approach for our young people. Such an approach would also put significant tension on teacher-pupil relationships. While some schools have called for centre-assessed grades, and I understand their position, I've equally heard from many schools who feel that cancelling examinations will put school leaders and teachers under terrible pressure, putting the schools at risk of numerous appeals and litigations. I've also heard from many young people in recent days who want examinations to go ahead. I'm quite sure, however, that this is not business as usual. I know our students are facing unprecedented disruption to their learning. That's why our exams will be different this year, and why I'll be taking exceptional steps to ensure that they are as fair as possible in the circumstances. School can be confident that my department and CCEA have the tools to make summer 2021 exams fair, and that young people in Northern Ireland will not be disadvantaged. So in conclusion, conclusion uh, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to address uh, you on these many issues. We're working hard to make sure that we take into account the effects of the pandemic to make the best contingency arrangements we can and to make sure exam results will be as fair and command public confidence. Again, I want to reiterate commending our school leaders uh, and teachers for their efforts. Unfortunately, we are continuing to face many challenges. Equally, I think we've seen innovation, we've seen opportunities right across our system. The integration of information technology and education has been rapidly accelerated by recent events. <coughs> our schools have embraced the possibilities of IT in exciting ways. My department will work with school leaders um, in, uh, to consider the role of technology and support educational delivery uh, and qualifications delivery. The rapid spread has demonstrated the importance of building resilience uh, and also an opportunity to remind ourselves of the skills students need in an unprecedented world, skills that are at the heart of Northern Ireland curriculum. Our aim must be to give our students the ability to work, uh, to think, learn, and to evolve, no matter what the challenges that await them uh, tomorrow, and unleash their potential to benefit the world. So thank you, Chair. Uh, myself and my team will be happy to take whatever questions you want. Thank you, Minister. Uh, it's my understanding that you're available until 11 o'clock, so we all, members and uh, Minister and officials, will have to be as concise as we possibly can with our, our, our questions. Can I echo um, your, your thanks and recognition of all teaching and non-teaching staff across Northern Ireland for their dedication and innovation throughout this extremely difficult time, and to thank uh, the department um, and yourself for all the measures that you have endeavoured to put in place um, to support uh, teaching, non-teaching staff and pupils 
um, with regard to education during this time. But there are a, a number of issues that I do have profound concerns about that I want to raise with you today, and that I do um, genuinely feel, if not uh, handled better, do, do pose a, a risk of, of registering a, a record from you of, of delayed, disengaged and, and morale-sapping decision-making. It, it's your opportunity to rebut that analysis today, and we can do that constructively. But to get to those issues, the first one is, is school closures. Um, our early cessation of school-based learning has been discussed since the summer. Um, Diane Dossel, Dawson, the principal of Braniel Primary School, um, gave a, a public call for an early cessation of school-based learning as long ago as November the 17th. Um, and you're now at risk of being to the right of the Conservative Party, who today have announced school-based learning will cease on, on uh, Thursday the 17th of December. Can I, I read you very quickly uh, a, a short piece of correspondence that I've received in this regard? Dear Chris, I'm a dedicated principal who works very hard to meet the needs of my pupils, their families, my staff. I do this with enthusiasm and love because I want to make a difference. I think I do this most of the time. We're underfunded, but I have a lot of heart that goes a long way. Last week, I tested positive for COVID-19. I'm sure I caught it at school because I don't get to go anywhere else. Today I received a letter from the Education Minister telling me, telling me that I had to continue to do more, to keep operating on a face-to-face -face basis unless the school boiler broke or someone died. I've been very ill. Hospitalisation could still be a possibility. What if something happens to me or a member of staff or a pupil? I truly believe we can do better than this. No one wants closure, just a short period of remote learning for people who want that choice. Yeah. I speak with the wisdom of personal experience. No one wants COVID-19 for Christmas. Yes. Minister, why have you not planned some sort of short early cessation of school-based learning in that context? Thank you, uh, thank you, Chris, for, as I share, for uh, a number of reasons. First of all, in terms of the comparison with England, what they are talking about is having one day in which there is a um, internal sort of workings within the school. They are effectively finishing day early, but don't forget they didn't take, um, there wasn't that extra week at Halloween, which we did take in relation to that. So from that point of view, I suppose we are, well, you say we're in a different position to, to England. In terms of school closures, I suppose there are a number of issues. Um, on the issue of education, while there's a lot of good work is happening with remote learning, it is undoubtedly the case that face-to-face -face teaching is better for our pupils than remote learning. It, it, it just You simply cannot say remote learning by its nature will always be a level of, of second best. Secondly, I suppose, from the point of view of uh, many parents, uh, from the perspective, and while some parents will, will take their own individual choices and they will look to what uh, is within their own individual families, to close school early would create enormous complications for tens of thousands of parents throughout society uh, who would have to either take time off work at a time when some of them, for instance, would simply have been resuming from furlough or indeed depend um, on that, uh, or indeed uh, would then have to have some form of emergency childcare. But particularly in terms of the issue of the, the health issue, there, there are risks within every um, situation. But whenever this issue, I think, uh, was discussed, the analysis from the, the medical experts are that at best, any, any form of school closure, the impact would be uncertain and may even be counterproductive. Because you're taking in the run up to Christmas, and this has been acknowledged by a number of, of, of health experts, including, I think, the, the indication that schools continuing for, I think, for example, publicly, Tom Black, who has not been the greatest supporter of the executive, who's always wanted the executive to go further, has said the right thing to do is for schools to be continuing on. That if you're putting into the community a third of a million children with the behavioural issues that are going to be there in the direct run up to Christmas, it is as likely that you're going to be increasing the R rate through that to a greater extent than you would through, through school. So I think it's a naive assumption to believe that simply sending children home, um, when we've seen, for example, that where there's been probably the biggest uh, particular outbreaks of COVID have actually been, particularly involving children, have been where there has been that widespread socialization. 
it will be sending out a signal that, that this is effectively uh, you know, a time simply to relax and let down the, the guard. I don't think from a health point of view that would be counterproductive and that sorry that that, that would be counterproductive. Okay. And that's why there's okay. been no there's been there's been no pressing there's been no pressing from anybody on the health side, whatever their views on, on other occasions, for any early closure closure of schools. Okay, I, I suspect other members will want to come in on that as well, and my time is is, is short. But can I ask you what what is the 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 final day of school based learning for schools across Northern Ireland? Well, schools have a level of flexibility in setting their their own uh, timetable. So, for instance, some schools may start their term a little bit later. Um, for most schools, it will be Friday the eighteenth of December. There will be a small number of schools which will, in terms of their timing, because they have a set number of days that they uh, they have in mind, that will probably go into the Monday or Tuesday of the following week. So it, it's not absolutely uniform across the system. And, and you think it's appropriate for teaching, non-teaching staff pupils to be in schools the week commencing Monday the 21st of December? I think if their school has, has organised it, I mean, look... Uh, you know, the reality is if there is a, an issue of self-isolation, that will kick in at a, at a much earlier stage in, in that regard. Look, I think it's appropriate that, that schools do their full complement of, of teaching. And those schools, for instance, that would be going certainly later into the year will actually be compensating in other parts of the year through, through other days. It's important to think that, that all children, as much as possible, get the same amount of uh, tuition, get the same amount of, of schooling on that, on that basis. OK. And that, look, what, what, is also, what is also being said... I was on a seminar there uh, last week, I think it was the week before, where the representative of PHA, and what they said is while there has been um, adult to adult spread, and largely speaking, at times there's been children, there is very, very little evidence of any level of, of spread between children and teachers. Okay. I, I, I find it astonishing that you haven't planned for some sort of short uh, cessation of school-based learning prior to Friday the 18th of December, but I, I need to move on. They need to move on the examinations quickly. Um, Minister, in your, your own data on the week commencing the 12th of October 2020, um, the percentage of pupils that were in school was 84.7%. My vulgar calculations suggest that there were, that means there was many as 50,000 pupils not in school that week. An NAHT survey of 89 primary schools in November found on average as many as 37% of P7 pupils uh, experiencing a COVID-19 related absence since the start of term. Um, and yet a um, considerable level of uncertainty remains regarding post-primary transfer, GCSE and A-level end of year examinations in 2021. Other jurisdictions of the UK have made decisions in respect of either cancelling examinations or providing examination guidance for school. You have indicated repeatedly that SEA is working on contingency options and that details would be shared shortly. Can you now end the confusion with paid to speculation in schools and tell the committee what your contingency plans are for examinations in 2021? No, look, I, I've said, first of all, that, that exams will go ahead. I've already announced some of the contingencies were actually well ahead of, of other bits which have been uh, referenced in terms of GCSE. Indeed, the level of, of assessment reduction on GCSE, for example, go well beyond what is there um, in England. And indeed, I think in other jurisdictions, they're still intending to cover uh, by way of assessment the entire curriculum, which I think is probably unrealistic. Look, I've indicated that we are at the final stages, and I hope to be in a position to be able to announce that next week. Now, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to jump the gun if the, we have got uh, a range of final considerations to be taken into account. If we're in a position then that that can be uh, finalised by early next week, I will make a statement directly to the Assembly on that. So the aim must be to try to get this out uh, before Christmas and have it out next next week, and I think we're on track to do that. But I think the proper place for that is to have everything in place uh, that can be in place before that announcement uh, is made. And we're not quite there yet. OK. Do contingency options that SIA is considering include the use of uh, moderated centre assessments? Well, look, from that point of view, no, that, that would not be a route down which uh, be aiming to go. But, you know... There's not a great deal of point in me saying I'm going to give, give the, the full announcement hopefully next week and then start to try to unpick elements of what's on the table and what's being discussed at this stage. 
Okay, you accept there is an urgency, and indeed, I would contend that oh, yeah, your, your current position is becoming increasingly look, untenable may, look, in relation to this be, particular issue. Yeah, look, uh, there there is an importance in relation to that, and look, let me, I suppose, give um, one indication. I think one of the things that, that is fairly clear throughout, and may at least give some level of, of reassurance. People have been talking about a level of parity. It is clear that whatever contingencies, whatever adaptations are put in place, that we need to ensure that the examination boards across the UK operate on a very similar basis. And consequently, I know that as part of the announcement that was made in England, they've indicated from the point of view of boards that, that grading and, if you like, the, the, the level at which things are being pitched in terms of grading will be the 2020 standards to make sure, therefore, that students this year are not disadvantaged compared with students last year. That will be something that will apply across the UK and will involve CCEA as well to ensure that they are on a similar basis. And that will also mean that there's an equality between students in Northern Ireland, because as the committee knows, we've roughly about 20% of our um, A-levels, for instance, are done, and smaller percentage than GCSE, are done by boards outside of, of Northern Ireland. Okay. All those, those pupils will be based on that more generous situation of the 2020 level rather than a 2019 level or a 2018 level. Okay. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for that update and for everybody attending this morning. I suppose I just want to start off by um, welcoming and congratulating Barry Mulholland in his new role as Chair of the Education Authority and also wishing Sharon O'Connor all the best, the outgoing Chair. When I pick up, Minister, from where the Chair has uh, a number of topics that the Chair has covered, and like yourself, I totally agree with you that face-to-face -face learning is the best uh, option for our children and young people. But throughout this pandemic, we have seen that we needed to put con contingencies in place and options. And uh, I think on this occasion, it wasn't about blanket closing of schools, but it was allowing our school leaders to uh, come forward with options and for you to engage and consult with them. Because some schools have already done this, and it's going to cause inconsistency across uh, our school estates. On that point, just picking up from what the Chair said around the closing date, I, I have been informed, um, some concerns have come forward to me, Minister, that the PHA advice line and EA advice line is to close on the 23rd of December. So if cases are picked up that week and over particularly Christmas Day and those days, who does principals contact in relation to tracking and tracing to support them through that process? Well, well Karen, I wasn't aware of the situation as regards to that date in terms of PHA, but we'll take that up with colleagues and get a, a detailed answer. I mean, I, I, you know, I think there will need to be something put in place that will be an emergency situation, generally speaking, as regards to the words. I think that's a dedicated line specifically for schools. One would assume in terms of the issues of track and tracing and indeed where people can get tests, that there will need to be some level of emergency cover that will be there over the Christmas uh, over the Christmas days. I think it is always likely that over Christmas that any public health uh, group will, will operate on a little bit more of a of a supposed skeleton staff, but uh, we will pursue up that that issue, and I'm sure that there will be a level of fallback that the general PHA line will be available. Be grateful if you would do that and put that level of well, support yeah. and, and speak yeah. to the unions and get that information out to both the unions and the school leaders in relation to what uh, support they would need over that period um, of closure because um, I'm sure that they will be involved in tracking and tracing. Minister, on the uh, examinations again following on, you may have heard this morning in the, the news that St Cecilia's in the Snail in my constituency have cance cancelled some modules in maths and English GCSE in January. Myself, um, uh, Daniel and the Chair met with students from St Cecilia's a number of weeks back and the reality for ourselves I think came across at that meeting of what students is going through. Um, so I'm just going to follow on from the Chair, but Minister, I have a conflict of interest here, so I'm going to outline it. My daughter, Neve Lamberton, she's in year 12. She has been had full attendance, and I think I told you this before, but since she has returned to school, she has had seven weeks off, uh, two periods of self-isolation. On her first day of returning last week, after four weeks of being off, she sat her Christmas exams, 
um, after being off for that period. So uh, she, she's obviously missed out in four months last year and now she's missed out in seven weeks. She's trying to catch up on the work um, uh, that they were for last year. And we see now that since Cecilia and Liz Neil has come out with this decision today, which I suppose as a parent, I, I probably would welcome it. Minister, all along and up until now, I have told her that yourself, SIA, your department and us are working very hard to provide clarity and support. And that would be with them long before Christmas. It's disappointing to hear from yourself today and yesterday that we will have to wait and you hope to bring out um, or more clarity on what that is next week. I would just ask you, I met with SIA a number of weeks ago. They outlined um, to myself some of uh, the options that may be there, why it has taken so long, and could you please outline to me today and for Neve and her fellow students what mitigations is going to be in place to support her uh, who is facing her... GCSE exams in January when she goes back? Well, look, uh, Karen, we, we'll be in a position that, that we can outline any of the stuff uh, next week. You ask why there's been a, a length of time. Look, I also think, to be honest, as regards looking at the curriculum, I don't think it's a helpful thing that if schools are going on a solo run as regards the, the curriculum, because when it comes to whatever tests are going to be there, there can be mitigations and adaptations we put in place. But it's not as if there would be a different GCSE for some schools to others. And that potentially could leave uh, schools that take uh, their own action at a disadvantage for their pupils. So I would uh, ward against, against that. In terms of, um, sorry, I just slightly lost track of thought there. Um, uh, mitigations obviously would need to take account of both the systems wide situation and also uh, where there would need to be a level of individual circumstances. Why has this taken so long? Because first of all, we want to try and make sure it's, it's got right. So it's not just the engagement of CCA, but there've been ongoing meetings we've had with uh, stakeholder principals. We have uh, also, I think, some work that will be uh, happening directly with pupils on that basis. But also we need to make sure um, that, that also any, and as you're aware, there are a range of options. We've got to make sure that, that not only is the best option therefore one that is fit for purpose, but also that we ensure that we get buy-in from uh, qualifications across the UK, but also that, that we don't, I mean, I think the one thing we've got to avoid is a scenario that we plump for a particular option that, for instance, the universities take a view of this is not acceptable or alternatively would regard our pupils on a different level to everyone else. So there are a range of connections that, that, uh, and discussions that have to take place and have been taking place in that in that regard. And I suppose to some extent, there is also maybe a certain level of restriction uh, because as a very small jurisdiction, um, we always think of ourselves as very special people in many ways we are, but uh, we cannot be in the same position as a national government, either in London or in Dublin, who largely speaking can set precisely their own agenda, really without having a great deal of cognizance about what's happening elsewhere. So look, I think it is important that we give that level of certainty to people uh, and that, that happens uh, very quickly, but I think we're on track to do that. Minister, just say the longer you leave this and the, the next week, the less time that schools and pupils have together to be able to prepare for two weeks again of being off at school, at home, trying to study. And as I said, you know, conflict of interest. I had a daughter who was sitting at a kitchen table crying. I don't want to see that over the Christmas period. And she's someone who needs to be in school. She's dyslexic. She needs the support. Um, so she can't be left. And, 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 and we heard that from many students. I would ask you again, I know you said you've engaged. I've asked you to meet with the secondary school union uh, students. I would ask you to do that, um, possibly over the next week as well, in relation we, we, to it. We, just to pause you briefly, sorry, I, I need you to bring these yep. remarks to a close. Karen, go ahead, Minister. Um, go ahead. No, sorry, just, uh, look, there, there will be, I think, some officials are meeting with the students today, actually, in, in connection with that, but I've left that at a, a level with my officials to, to deal with that on it. Just a final one, a quick one, yes. hopefully. Minister, it's a priority, obviously, to keep schools open. Um, uh, can you tell us of any discussions that you have had to add school staff 
to the priority list for vaccinations? Yeah, look, I would be, Karen, I'd be very much in favour of that, and I'll be making those representations to health. The one restriction uh, we have in connection with that in terms of where the prioritisation, and I think there's good sense in making, um, in pushing particularly school staff um, up the agenda. The position is that that is actually determined by um, which all four of the UK nations are involved in, um, a UK-wide team from the health end who decide that. So the, the freedom of manoeuvre that is there directly for Northern Ireland at present is, is pretty limited, and uh, if at all, in that, in that regard. So they will agree priorities, and it seems at the moment that the principal priorities are largely focused in on, um, particularly on, on an age basis rather than a profession basis. But no, I, I've already indicated that, that uh, I will be contacting through the Minister of Health and asking him to raise the, the issue in terms of prioritisation for uh, for school staff, but it's it's a decision which lies out with I think Northern Ireland as a whole. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank Thanks, you. Karen. Robin Newton. Thank you, and I thank the Minister and his staff uh, for for again uh, being with us, uh, Minister. I think it might be appropriate that we uh, mention the the recent figures of the our primary school pupils and their achievement in the maths field. So can I extend certainly my congratulations to you? the Department of Education Authority, uh, and indeed right down into our, our teaching staff, uh, principals uh, and, and support staff, because I think those figures have uh, been uh, given quite, quite a fill-up to our pupils and, and quite kudos to, to our pupils across Northern Ireland. It's right that they be recognised. Can I, Minister, can I refer to a letter that you've sent through from the Department um, dated the 3rd of December on the update on the Child Care Sustainability Support Fund. Um, mm. You'd indicated in the uh, outlines the, the amount of money that's been allocated. But the final paragraph uh, is headed up further funding. And uh, you, you've indicated that uh, your officials are currently working on a further funding scheme which will address temporary closures and that would be during the period September to December and that you will be announcing that uh, in, in due course. Minister, on such a, an important issue, could you perhaps give us uh, some update on your thinking in the Child Care S Sustainability Fund? Well, uh, Robin, in, in relation to that, as, as you say, there's, there's the two strands to this. One is the, the broad sustainability side of it. Um, and through the COVID funding, we successfully bid um, for, uh, for funding. I think 8.5 million of that was towards the sustainability ongoing recovery, because I think one of the issues that everybody realises as well, um, and very understandably, is that a lot of the childcare facilities are operating under a much more constrained regime because of some of the health requirements, and that will be additional cost. And so consequently, there's 8.5 million there. There has been on the closure side, um, we had also bid successfully for 2.8 million, and added, I suppose, of um, from the previous recovery fund, there was about 800,000 uh, left over. So that's a package of 3.6 million. Um, the aim, I suppose, in terms of the... Uh, on the sort of closure, the temporary closure scheme, is we we will be aware that that a number of um, well, perhaps if you like, COVID may at times be less prevalent directly amongst the very young. There will be at times a number of uh, childcare settings, and also there's provision uh, for child minders as uh, as part of that as well. Um, so the the idea within that uh, would be that there would be allocations. So if, for example, periods for on a, a weekly or fortnightly basis, if a facility has to be closed as a result of that because of, for instance, close contacts through uh, an outbreak or whatever, there will be funding available. That will ratchet up, largely speaking, I think with a, uh, off the top of my head, I think on the closure side of it for um, childcare facilities, there will be a, ultimately a cap, but it will go up on the basis of, um, with an initial amount, but a provision according, it will go up in... Uh, batches of about £500 for each batch of, uh, as you add on, eight um, 
eight pupils, and I think it goes up. I think ultimately to I think a cap of around about ten thousand pounds would be the maximum uh, in in connection uh, with that for the very large ones. Because we want to make sure that uh, that there's sort of a reasonable level of uh, of doing that. I think uh, that will cover all the uh, all the things that are not covered elsewhere. So I know that, for instance, there would be some that where there is a direct funding through health for a particular, uh, for instance, say you know a particular childcare facility or whatever. Um, so it would cover, if you like, the mainstream side of it. So the two funds are to cover both general sustainability, but also then those are hit specifically with with particular closures. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask uh, just? Uh, perhaps push you a little bit further. Uh, you in response to the deputy chair, in terms of the um, vaccine uh, and the vaccination rollout program. Yes. Uh, and uh, perhaps if you'd outline to us what you might be seeking to achieve there, uh, can I also make the point that it is not just the staff who are directly in contact with the pupils on a day, teaching staff but indeed the other support staff and indeed those who are in and out of the school that uh, may need to, 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 to be included if you felt that um, you, you could achieve a designated key worker status for, for those folk. Yeah, I mean, look, at the moment, as far as I'm aware, and it lies within, within health, the UK-wide position, I think, is not particularly to focus in on key workers, but to try... Um, to, uh, if you like, the batches that will be available are largely speaking on, on the grounds of, of age. Now, I think certainly while it would be difficult for any of us to make an argument that, uh, for example, in the, the, the batch that would be aimed at the over 80s, for instance, that uh, people within a broader school environment of whatever nature would take priority over those, I think, we, I think it would be very useful if there was a level of prioritisation for uh, for those those key workers, the way this is likely to roll out in terms of the vaccine um, is that the UK as a whole, and Northern Ireland, get its share of it. Will get certain batches of, of vaccine, and the idea is, is essentially to use those up in their entirety uh, throughout that. But I think there's a good argument that in terms of those who are the staff within the school, I think it's also important that those who have particular medical vulnerabilities who are who may still be very young will be included within uh, periods now. I suppose the point that, that I'm making as regards that is, I will be arguing the case for that. I suppose the one restriction is, I have to argue the case directly with Department of Health, uh, and they will act effectively as a level of proxy in the UK-wide bit, but it is not, to be fair, because I don't want anybody then to be criticising Department of Health, it is not their decision internally to be able to say what the order of prioritisation of the, the vaccine is. There is a UK-wide group which is trying to ensure that the, the rollout of the vaccine is done as uniformly as possible throughout the uh, throughout the UK. So even if Northern Ireland, for instance, was to make an argument saying such and such should be the case, uh, whether it would be a question of trying to persuade everybody else towards that, that position. Okay, Robin, that's time. Okay. 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 Thank, thanks very much, Robin. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister, for being with us today and to your officials. Uh, as you'll realise, there are very serious issues and challenges facing our schools, our teachers and our young people. Uh, and I uh, am extremely concerned, not just as a member of this committee, but as a, an MLA for West Tyrone. Uh, I'm seeing the huge impact of decisions or uh, indecision uh, from you and your department and the impact it is having on schools and young people across uh, all the constituencies in Northern Ireland. I have to say, Minister, it is good to hear you say uh, thank you to teachers and to our young people, but those are words and to many are meaningless given that you have continually ignored those same people and continue to, particularly after what happened in the summer in relation to examinations. Many have said they feel like you're standing in the wilderness with your hands over your ears refusing to listen to anybody. And I would think you would struggle to find many who would agree with you in relation to your agenda around examinations uh, uh, presently. There are huge issues. The Children and Young People's Commissioner has spoken out against your agenda, as has the Mental Health Champion, as have all of the teachers and principals and young people that I have spoken to. Your inaction and indecision is having a hugely detrimental impact on the well-being of our young people and your ignorance around the reality 
of COVID and how it has impact, impacted on our children's education is absolutely unjustifiable and unforgivable. And this go compare nonsense, Minister, that continues to come from your mouth in the Chamber and in statements is entirely unhelpful because we cannot compare to Scotland or Wales or England, which you continue to do. Scotland and Wales have moved. Wales, not an ideal situation, but they have moved. Scotland has moved significantly into a very positive position. England is an entirely different situation to ours. Why? Because they have had a considerable uh, difference in how they, they are uh, educated, particularly given the mitigations that are in place to protect young people, and particularly given that the course has been uh, taught a year earlier in some instances. So what you are doing is entirely without precedent. Uh, and also, Minister, in the current situation, you're going to leave a lot of people very badly let down. I fear, Minister, for these young people, and I fear, unfortunately, that you have not learned the lessons of the summer, which is a very unforgivable situation, given the impact it has had on our young people and our children. And I'll go further than that, Minister. You use words around fair. There is nothing fair about this agenda. I understand that this situation is not straightforward. I understand you have not got a blueprint or a rule book. But I would like to believe that you have learned something from what happened in the summer. Uh, and I've also spoken to uh, Sia as well as the Deputy Chair has related. And I can tell you the attitude in Sia is much different than the one prior to the crisis in the summer that emerged uh, from uh, the actions that you have taken. Minister, I've said to you yesterday in the Chamber, and I say it again, you're in the bad books of a lot of teachers and a lot of young people and students across Northern Ireland. But I am making a plea to you. I'm making a plea to you to recognise the reality we are in and our young people are in and to cancel GCSE and A-level examinations this year. Do not talk to us about England and do not talk to us about what Wales aren't doing or, uh, uh, or anything else. I want to hear about what actions and what decisions you're taking to protect our young people. And that moves me to a few questions, Minister. You're on half do, your time. Do, you not, be, accept, be careful, you, do you not accept... That the real catalyst for the stress levels has been your indecision, Minister, around how assessments will operate. And secondly, Minister, is it not the case that in uh, the minister, the, that the minister, and other, the ministers in other jurisdictions have made decisions in respect of either abolishing exams or putting a fresh raft of mitigations in place to relieve the pressure on their young people, while you have sat on the fence? Don't you think, Minister, that you should now apologise meaningfully and absolutely? to our young people and to our teachers for scapegoating them and for dithering on a very serious issue in relation to the futures of our young people. Why are they left dangling? Because you're ultimately going to have to make a decision uh, in the end, particularly in January. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I detected at the end even a couple of questions at the, the end of that, as opposed to just a, a certain level of, of um, diatribe that, that came before it. Look, let, let me make it clear. There's not a lack of decision. We want to try to make sure that Minister, all information just, just, is taken. Just, just to echo something, Minister, what I have said to you is a reflection of all of the various correspondence I have received from teachers. So yeah. I would gladly respond to them and say that you have described such as diatribe, which would not go down no, well, and that's the, the issue. Daniel, 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 don't put words into my mouth. I described the way that you've put things but, in this sort of uh, soap opera-like like way that you've you've put that forward as a level of diatribe. I'm not attacking and, and, I'm not attacking Mr. Pause, with pause respect, for a second for me, please. With please let me, I'm, I'm chairing this meeting. Let me intervene momentarily, yeah. OK? All right? I don't, okay. think, I don't think diatribe is appropriate. However, I, however, however, I will also add, Daniel, you're almost out of time for your questioning here. So if I can bring you back, both back, to a concise response, okay. Minister, concise, and because concise, we're, we're almost out of time for think, Daniel. Thank you, Minister. We're trying, to take in, we're trying to take into account all information. That also includes uh, the work that has been done by Deloitte in terms of the 2020 situation. It's important that that is, that is taken into account whenever, whenever final decisions are reached. What you describe as indecision, I've made it absolutely clear that examinations are, are taking place. Now, what I think uh, and we want to make sure then that the adaptations are the correct ones, which takes a little bit of time to do that. You said it's, it's wrong to compare, for instance, with England, but particularly as regards our A-level situation, England represents um, over 80% of the, of the market in terms of students. Those will be the people directly that people are competing against uh, for university places. And we also have a situation that uh, English boards, which are under the control of the Westminster government, that will be done by roughly speaking about 20% of our pupils. So this, this idea that simply we can be in some 
uh, hermetically sealed bubble in Northern Ireland as regards examinations is not correct. We are listening to people. We're working closely with uh, the, the panel that we have of, uh, of principals from across a wide range of schools, uh, both grammar, non-grammar, um, a range of, of the different sectors in, in that regard. So, you know, it is also about listening to what they are saying. We will be coming to a common position with SIA and we will make sure that, that everything is done to protect uh, our pupils. But don't distinguish uh, or sort of misinterpret that uh, simply because you're not getting the decision you want, that that is regarded as some form of dithering. What we're trying to do is to make sure that uh, all information is taken into account so we can actually have proper adaptations and mitigations as we, we move ahead. Yeah, Dan, your time is almost it's up. It's, you it's have a, a very, very brief, brief supplementary. Minister, thank you for your answer. But uh, if you look at the situation around A level, Scotland and Wales have already moved and they haven't consulted with us in relation to whether our universities will accept their students. So why are you continuing to use this as an excuse well, to prevent the decision being Scot reached in the interest of your Scotland own people? Is large, is, Scotland is largely speaking have their own exam situation. Uh, their own, they've always had a very different set of, of exams. Wales. Let's face it, Wales are actually backtracking us. Wales are doing examinations by a different name, but they're still examinations. That's not just my view. But for example, the NHT in Wales have said these are examinations. Because what is part of as part of their proposal as well? Where we can peel through a level of uncertainty as regards Wales, Wales are doing external assessments, externally set and externally marked. Now, presumably if those are going to be done on a fair basis to every every student. Those would have to be done on the same basis for every student, which means examination conditions. So if you're doing an external exam, an external assessment, externally set, externally marked in exam conditions, how is that not an examination? You can call it something else, but it's still an exam situation. It is, from that point of view, it is, it is bogus in, in that regard. So let's not, okay. let's not throw wheels okay. in as some example of okay. abandonment of exams, because they are doing exams. Okay. I mean, however, Wales have also appointed an independent panel to ensure uh, engagement with the sector as well. And of course, Scotland has gone further and, and yeah. cancelled um, nationals and hires. I need to move us on, Minister. Um, can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA, please? Thank you, Minister. Robbie. Hello, Chair. Um, Go ahead, can Robbie. you guys just clarify that you can see and hear me? Because my signal is pretty poor. See and hear you loud and clear. Here, go. And I, I, I can hear you. I hear you loud and clear, Robbie, as well. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, um, just it'll, my my points will follow on from uh, most of the, most of what has already been covered, but uh, I think there's some clarity, hopefully, that you could maybe give today, because uh, I would agree with you that you have made statements on examinations and in, and indeed on school closures, but what has been missing is your rationale for doing so. For for instance, if we look at um, the school closures and the call for school closures, and I understand and accept that it's it's not, uh, it's not simple because there are impacts on uh, different pupils, vulnerable pupils, for instance, those with SEN uh, and, and medical conditions, for instance, that need, need to be taken into consideration. But what has been lacking is your rationale for that. And I know that today at the start of your briefing, you hinted at the Department of Health or Health not, late, not maybe contributing or maybe not coming to you with um, uh, an ask. And I, I don't believe it is theirs to ask you are the Minister for Education. Um, would it not be fair then to suggest that what actually has been missing is the detail as to how and why you're coming to these decisions? For instance, taking the first one, which is the closure or the non-closure of schools at the end of this week. No, uh, look, Robbie, from that point of view, we, we've tried to make information uh, clear as, as possible. What I'm saying, look, you're right in terms of where a decision doesn't lie in that sense of the Department of Health, but where they will make an assessment at times of as they have done in part of the broader bits of regulations of here's our impact of a particular sector, whether that's open or closed on that basis. I think they have fairly consistently given an indication uh, while saying that other factors will outweigh this of what the, the impact of schools being open on the R rate, for instance, will be. The position, and I'm, I'm careful here because I don't want to want to breach too much of what's been said directly within the, the executive, but the approach that has been taken, certainly as regards to this, I think it would be fair to say that the, the, the principal people have said the impact of closing early would at best be uncertain and may even be counterproductive. Because the issue is, it's not simply what happens within a school, it's what the behavioural aspect will replace that. And what we have seen, for example, 
Um, if we take the situation that the, where the biggest single outbreak that we had, which was in uh, Craig Avon, for example, was fuelled by socialisation which took place towards the end of the, the Halloween break. It was what was happening outside school. And there is a real concern, and I have had this from quite a number of, of principals as well, that particularly in the post-primary sector, that if you simply close schools early, that the, first of all, the, the issue about what level of engagement there'll be necessarily for remote learning and the, effectively what will be the week before Christmas may be somewhat limited. But actually there is a real concern uh, that particularly teenagers will in many ways see this as an extra element of a longer period off and that the behavioural aspects will actually drive up R much greater than would happen within schools. You're also left with the prospect that in terms of younger children, they may well spend a good deal of that week um, simply being taken by their parents around various shopping centres okay, and out in the community. Okay. So it's, it, it is that, there is that health side of it, as well as the educational, as well as the impact on, on parents as, as well, which okay. is why I've had a lot of correspondence also as well, people saying, please, whatever you do, don't close the schools early. Okay. Robbie, yeah. Robbie, um, Robbie, would you grace me with a very, very quick comment here? Uh, I'll, be, and I'll, I'll factor it in. Minister, I don't think this is just about the R rate. It's about, it's about giving teaching, non-teaching staff children a Christmas with loved ones after a brutally difficult pandemic. I, I leave that. don't want to use Robbie's time. Robbie, you want to come back in there? Yeah, yeah but let, sorry, let, sorry, let, sorry, Minister. Sorry, sorry, no, sorry, no, sorry, no, sorry, no, you're, but, but you're, you're, you're having fair time, time, Minister. I need to let Robbie come back. You can't just you can't just throw out a comment. Oh, okay, and be, not, not be brief. Then. Be brief. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, be brief. The reason why the R rate is so important is because if people are actually then in a position where they are catching the virus through different different means or exposing themselves by way of close contacts with people, that will also impact on families and prevent people uh, creating the uh, being able to, to spend Christmas time with the, the loved ones. So if everybody, for instance, was going out of school and simply remaining in their home for that period of time, not going out, operating in, in effectively a form of bubble throughout that, that may be a different situation from a health point of view, but that is not the way the behavioural aspects will, will happen. Robbie, Robbie. Thank you, Chair, um, uh, thank you, Minister. And to be fair, um, the interjection by the Chair and your, your response, Minister, really does get to the root of, of my, my position and my point, and it is, um, you, you've stated those things today on committee, but this probably this discussion has been raging for certainly more than a week now. Um, and I think people in Northern Ireland, whether they're students, teachers or, or, or parents, have the capacity to understand information when it's given to them. And if you can back up your position with fact or statement or the fact that you've asked the Department of Health for that information, that is probably no, forgivable. But what, what, what is difficult to understand is when there's just a statement which says that the, the schools will, re, will remain open. People could factor that in if, if there was a, a scientific and medical reason for that. No, I think, um, look, I think what, what, has been, what has been said, Robbie, by the medical people is... The impact at best, if you were to close early, would be uncertain that there is not, you know, whereas there may be other parts of the year, which if you purely did it from a health point of view, everybody remaining at home would have some uh, clear reduction, you know, albeit it may be outweighed by other factors on the R rate. They're saying the behavioural aspects in the, the, the Christmas are uncertain and may be, uh, at the best case scenario, may have a marginal benefit. And the worst case scenario may be clearly counterproductive in that in that regard. On it, that is what is being being said. Not a question if you like of us particularly seeing it. And don't uh, detail sometimes the, the direct conversations would take place during during the executive. I think that would be inappropriate in that regard. But that is that is the sense of where things are, are coming from um, within that. And if uh, believe me, if there was even if even if a different view across the executive ultimately was taken, if the Department of Health took a view that the right thing to do was to take a particular course of action, they will not be short of at least making that as a recommendation or making it clear that that, that, is, their, that is their position. OK. Um, but I still think that, um, you know, in terms of w w when these fundamental um, questions are raised, that the, the rationale behind it is really important um, for you as the Minister to deliver. Some of it's there today, but it has been missing up to this point. It gives some sort of clarity, even if it doesn't the answer that some people um, require. I, I'll just move on very briefly then um, to um, the examinations for next year, if that's OK. And rather than go over absolutely the ground that has been covered so far, I'm going to concentrate perhaps on um, what, what may be the case. Uh, you, you've, you've stood up a couple of times in the chamber and, and, and on the TV. I've, I've heard you say something which I've actually really disagreed with, because what you've pitched it as, as you've said, the, the options are either doing the exams as normal, which is the first way, 
or ongoing testing and assessment on a monthly basis, and it's unfair to, to subject pupils to that. I would agree if that was a binary option, but do you and I know that this is not a binary option, that there are multiple uh, options on the table. One of those options is use of moderated centre assessments. They could be undertaken by the schools under examination conditions. Teachers and teaching bodies have already expressed their ability to do that. Um, and they could be moderated by CCEA. Um, could you update us on uh, any talks that have been ongoing with regard to that as a contingency or as no, an option? Think, look, uh, moderate, first of all, uh, centre assess, moderated centre assess grades will still require a large number of tests because a school will not want to have challenges, will not want to face the possibility even of a parent taking a legal challenge against the school. That, I think, one of the impacts of that will mean that schools will be constantly testing pupils. You, know, you can't get away from that. But you mentioned moderated uh, assessment grades, which were done under examination conditions. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting a child under an examination condition in which they do an assessment, how is that not an examination? I'm not, no, but I'm not, I'm not saying, suggesting that it's, a, a, I'm saying it's another option, given the fact that there's so much yeah. classroom time that's been lost. But, what I'm saying is, but, it's but, not but, you, you've, pitched it, you've pitched it, Minister, as if there's a binary options between constant assessment or examinations at the end. When actually, the, what we've been asking for is contingencies to examine all of the possibilities. And what I'm suggesting yeah. is that there is a all option. Of the yeah, and all, pitch one against the other, and that's unfair. No, no, Robbie, I, I, from that point of view, with what has been developed through SEA, is a wide range of. of I feel like all options have been there. I think we're narrowing down in terms of where uh, the likely result will be. I think the point on that bit is that uh, because examinations in and of themselves test the individual and are not subject to any form of subject, and, and look, I think there are a number of flaws in terms of the centre assessed side of things. So, first of all, I think you can't get away that if centre assessed, if, if schools are to feel confident in what they are predicting, that that will lead to an increased level of testing. If, as I said, this is, is testing on the basis under examination conditions, it, it does strike me you then end up with the worst of, of all worlds uh, within that. And you end up with a situation which is less robust and less fair, uh, and also while creating the stress of examinations as well. So, you know, I, I think you end up with, with the worst of with all of those, uh, that, that cocktail of, of combinations. on. But also, from the point of view of, of moderation, how is somebody from, uh, I mean, they simply won't be the people with the level of qualifications to be able to, to do a moderation of each individual center assessed grade. I mean, who, who are going to be the people that, that are going to do that? You're talking about tens of thousands of, of children doing this. You're talking about then assessing whether, for instance, because it would apply some form of, of presumably ranked order as well on that basis, whether some people are doing it more leniently than those. And I think that's just the nature of human nature on it. I don't see a particularly robust way and a fair way in which you can have that moderation. But again, you know, whereas it's, it's one of a wide range of options that are there on the table, it's not one which I think is particularly valuable because I think it is a danger that it actually creates the worst of all worlds in, in every uh, sphere in that regard. Okay, I, I disagree with you. But yeah, I disagree with you on that point, but that's that's probably where we'll be. I think one of the things that you're probably running into difficulties with is, um, and you're right, maybe about running out of goodwill, because when you look at how the um, assessors and moderators were treated uh, with regard to those that had for many years provided the, the the marking and moderation of papers, and they were disrespected at the end of the process last time, they're not going to be there next year, and we're going to run into difficulties. Um, if, if, if examinations don't run forward due to COVID uh, in that way. Man, yeah, just last question then, Chair. No, I've um, asked this before, to, Minister. You to talked stop. about... Robbie, sorry, I've oh. to stop there. We're, we're well over time, OK? If I've time at the end, I'll bring you back in, OK? Uh, is sorry, William Robbie, Humphrey... Thanks, is William, William Humphrey there? I know there was some issue with IT. William? No. OK, I'll come back to William then. Nicola? Nicola Brogan, MLA. Uh, thank you, Chair, and again, I thank the Minister for coming in and providing that update today. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for um, mentioning the fact that the teachers, like you've welcomed the fact that teachers have worked so hard to get the schools reopened in August, and I certainly echo that. And just on the point of vaccinations, because of that, we know that they are, by being in the schools, um, are putting their own health at risk and the health of the families at risk. So I would urge you, you know, to ask. Um, 
Department of Health, wherever it is, to um, make our teachers and school workers a priority when it comes to the vaccination. Um, in regards to exams, you've been over GCSE and AS and A-level exams, but um, we've been engaging with BTEC students um, who have some serious concerns in relation to their workload and coursework. Um, could you briefly comment on what the direction of travel is for supporting these students in terms of adjustments or alternative arrangements, please? So, uh, sorry, is it, sorry, Nicola, could you repeat the last bit? It just faded out a little bit there. Yeah, so can you comment on the direction of travel and supporting yeah, BTEC students I, yeah. um, in terms of adjustments or alternative arrangements? Okay. Look, directly speaking, uh, first of all, in terms of the issue on the vaccine side of it, um, yes, I will do. I mean, look, the point is because I don't want to be um, anybody to think I'm in any way putting any level of, of criticism if this then doesn't, isn't successful at the Department of Health. I, I will make the argument to the Department of Health, to be fair to the Department of Health, or indeed the executive, it's not within their gift to particularly um, be able to deliver on that because it will be taken on a wider context outside of, of Northern Ireland in that regard. So regarding the BTEC side of it, maybe I'll, I'll pass over to, to Karen, yeah, maybe so just in relation to that. Yeah, hopefully I can answer the question. That, um, and if not, I'll come back to you in more detail. But um, some of those qual the qualifications sit within the department for the economy, but there, obviously these are delivered within schools. Um, and the SEA regulation, you know, has been working with the other uh, regulators on further flexibilities around adaptations in those vocational qualifications. And there was an announcement by Ofqual on the 3rd of December that um, confirmed further changes to the um, vocational and technical qualifications that will allow awarding bodies to reduce the number of units assessed and um, implement further flexibilities, you know, around, as I say, um, the assessment, the awarding, and um, and other general qualifications. So, yeah, that is being taken forward as far as I'm aware. Okay, thank you for that there update. Um, finally, Minister, can I just ask you about the child care support fund? Um, there were complaints that the previous fund was too complex and slow to allocate. Um, what reassurances can you give to childcare sector that a more efficient and timely allocation well, of funding is now in place? I, I think. I, 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 I think, to be, to be fair, Nicola, uh, there's been effectively, I suppose, two sets of this is the two sets of childcare uh, funds. The, the first, uh, which uh, was run by BSO, yes, I think there was a lot of criticism, and there was actually only a small percentage was ultimately then uh, sort of progress, particularly in time. I think, to be fair, because the, the more recent one was run in terms of by the early years organisation. It ended up with, I think, um, because you, you always slightly over pitch uh, to sort of ensure that you have enough money within uh, within that. I think, in terms of that particular scheme, um, I think that more than ninety percent of the money that was um, that was put in in budget was then able to be directly claimed on that basis. And as I said, you'll always overestimate. So I think there was a much more rapid movement and much more efficient system. And indeed, I think some of the lessons that were there from the first set. Um, which created problems, which was, I think, also overly bureaucratic. And indeed, I think whenever there was attempts to help and support BSO, there wasn't a great deal of interest um, in that. Early years organisations, I think, uh, did a much um, much more efficient job of being able to de deliver that funding. And so therefore, I think there'd be confidence that there would be uh, delivery on um, on that as well. And I think the fact that, that the amounts in terms of the process that are relatively straightforward, it's not an overly complex process. Would mean I think there's confidence that that money will be will be got out. Um, well, hopefully that is the case. Um, can I just finally ask? The last announcement there, I think, was for correct me if I'm wrong, but it was for September this year to December. But the applications yeah. opened on last Friday, the fourth of December. When should um, the applicants expect to receive payments? Uh, well, I think as soon as possible. I don't. I don't have an exact. Exactly. But look, well, um, from that point of view, Nicola, we'll, we'll be happy to provide further information to the, the committee just in relation to the timings issues around that. No problem. Thank you for that. that was, I mean, I should, I should point out, obviously, as regards to that, uh, I suppose one of the reasons why it's a bit a bit later is that we got uh, money through whenever there was, I think in I think in November, there was a range of additional COVID allocations were, were put in place by the executive and agreed. Uh, and obviously we'd bid for that for some time, but it's only at that point where the green light, yeah, was it? 29th Sorry, actually, 29th of October, I think, was 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 where 
there was an agreement at the executive to, to allocate um, on that basis, so the process has been running on from that point on. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, can I bring in Justin McNulty and just advise William Humphrey if, he, if his internet is working to try and um, uh, sit to get that message to myself or the clerk to bring him back in? Uh, Justin McNulty? Justin? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thanks, thank you, Minister, thank you, Ricky, Gary, James, and Karen. Um, just want to second uh, what others have said and what the Minister has said in terms of what teachers and what principals and what school staff are doing and have been through this last number of months and the lengths to, to which they've gone to to try and uh, ensure that children's education is disrupted as, as minimally as possible and at often at um, medical risk to themselves and that, that's to be very, very much commended and we need to really recognise the work that, that, that our school teachers are doing. Um, Minister, in terms of the well, principals will eventually get a break um, for Christmas, but how, how will they get a break for Christmas when schools will remain open often until the 22nd of December? They've worked tirelessly to keep the schools, get the schools back open in, in, in August. Uh, they are contract tracing, contact tracing over Halloween. How then do you expect them to be on call for five days after the schools closes? Um, for many of them, the school doesn't close until the 22nd, as I said, and then with the EA holidays, which takes us to the 27th of December. You expect them to read a 68 page document on the holidays, uh, which with, with revised uh, COVID-19 restart, you know, the revised COVID-19 restart document, respond to all the special education needs consultation, consult, consultation there, which does finish in, in our start in, in January, the close of start of January, that, that consultation closes in January, and then implement the budget legislation alongside implementing and overseeing contact tracing, time budgets, engage money, and where being money, when are we going to get a break? Well, look, from, from that point of view, look, I mean, first of all, I should say in terms of the uh, SEND consultation, it was ex being extended to allow people just that bit of extra time in that regard um, on that basis. I think extending sort of consultation is never particularly a bad thing, provided uh, we get that, that right. Look, I think there's a lot of um, hard work that has been going on. I think, um, look, in terms of... Um, the additional elements of uh, funding to engage through some of the mental health, you know, those opportunities have been there for some time and have been allocated. I suspect that it should be that, that a lot of those decisions will already have been made on that on that basis. Uh, as regards documentation, it is always the case that we need through the advice we get from public health reserve. There will be constant iterations. The, the general principles, largely with any level of advice will remain will remain the same. But we do have to always do that little bit of refresher in terms of additional pieces of information. What changes within that are, on the grand scheme of things, relatively small, so it shouldn't make too much of a direct direct impact. Um, and I suppose in terms of, um, and I don't know whether, because uh, I think you, you looked, I appreciate you had a question yesterday, which then wasn't able to be taken directly in the, the chamber. Uh, we are working in terms of initial pilot, but which I think will also, if it works out, will be helpful uh, with PHA in terms of a couple of the schools in Limavadi on a more rapid uh, testing uh, regime. That's been done as a pilot at, at present. And if that works, I think that's something which could then be of a major advantage to uh, schools in terms of minimising disruption, ensuring that, that students can be uh, in place. So, you know, there is good work that's going on on that side of it as well. Just, just very briefly, just Minister... Justin asked you a really, really clear question there. What what level of break are principals and teachers going to get over this Christmas holiday? What how many days? What what is your understanding? Well, my understanding is they would, they the would be largely they speaking. Get? They're largely speaking getting getting their their normal holidays on that on that basis. On it, it would be according to the the normal dates that schools are are put in place. For all of us, I think we're facing additional burdens because of of COVID. There's no getting around that, and I'm sure. All of us will be doing things over that Christmas uh, Christmas break, which normally perhaps we wouldn't necessarily be doing on that basis. But the break will be the same as it normally as it normally is. Justin, you want to come in? You want to come in on that? Given, Minister, that doesn't really wash. Given the extra burden on principals on teaching staff over this last number of months, over this last uh, almost a year, it's extraordinary to think that they're going to have to continue to work 
after the school is closed and contact tracing and um, I think I'd need some more interrogation. Justin, Justin, in terms of contact tracing, until we move to a situation, for instance, where there is a much wider testing regime on that basis, that would be the case, you know, irrespective of if, if dates were moved, there would still be then some level of some level of activity. And for, for many, uh, for most principals from most schools, there won't be any level of contact in, in relation to uh, in relation to uh, levels of uh, of issues in, in relation to that. But that, you know, there will be a, a there's inevitably going to be some uh, risk of that happening, irrespective of whatever dates are, are there in place. And that's, to be honest, on a, unfortunately, for all of us, the position that a lot of us are in, there, there will be some stuff that will that will that will crop up over the, the the Christmas period, which will impact on all of us. And that's unfortunately some of the complications that are being brought by COVID is being brought by the broader bit of public health. Okay, thanks. Very much. Some some pupils, as Karen touched on earlier, are now in their third period of self isolation, and that's having an enormous impact on their mental health. Obviously, they're concerned about the impact on their examination performance when they have had less face-to-face -face time with their, their teachers than their peers. In the shorter term, um, you know, I'm concerned about what will happen if there are confirmed COVID-19 cases next week. Does the minister understand that one case in a GCSE year group can cause 40 pupils having to, to isolate? If this happens next week, we can see pupils being unable to join their family over Christmas. What, what's your but perspective in on terms, that? In terms, of, in terms of isolation, let us remember what should be the case in terms of, of, of identifying close contacts. It's supposed to be those who are within two metres for more than 15 minutes. Now, if, for example, people are sitting in the same places each, each day, if an individual tests, and in most cases where we have had an outbreak, it has been on the basis of uh, one individual in that regard. There shouldn't be a reason why there should be 40 contacts for one individual. Well, that's what, what I mean, I'm told by teachers on the ground that is happening. So one case in classroom yeah, comes some, out of sometimes, sometimes that can be because of whatever interpretation is put in relation to that. Close contact is defined as within two metres for more than 15 minutes. Yeah, but it's also more than that, Minister. It's, 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 it's also for, for one metre for a less time period than that as well. So that, that's, that's, that's if not there's, if, there's, if, there's a level, if there's a level still of very much of close contact, but again, yeah. The point should be that if you've got people in different parts of a of a, a room, it, it shouldn't be the entire room which suddenly then comes as a close contact on that basis. And if you look at the, the, the rollout of figures that would suggest that is the case. Now, different people will make different levels of interpretation sometimes in relation to it, but that is the direct guidance out of PHA. Yeah, there, there, are, there are 500 pupils self-isolating in one school at this moment in time. Justin, bring you uh, back and, in. And, and, and on, that, on that basis, Chair, first of all, not all of those have been identified as, as close contacts. I think they are okay. in large because the school has taken a view that it is easier rather than to try to do a mixture of remote learning and face-to-face -face learning to do uh, the lot. There was a very large level of outbreak, there, sensible, yep. outbreak okay. there, one of which I know is, is linked Part of which is linked to socialisation, where indeed there was an 18th birthday party the Saturday before uh, the major bits of, of okay. Okay. which shows, I think, shows I think the danger, the danger of community transfer and the need for all of us to be, uh, all of us to be uh, very vigilant over Agreed. not Agreed. just the Christmas period but beyond. Agreed. Minister, Justin, Justin. Yep. Minister, in terms of isolation, I mean, we've, we've, at this committee, we've all raised concerns about the impacts and the, the, the greatest impact to kids who come from coming from disadvantaged backgrounds on to kids who are from have special educational needs. Yes. Is and they've, they've, they've been left behind and been the, the attainment gap is growing right because of this this pandemic and that has to be addressed. Is ten p per pupil per day enough to address the loss of learning and emotional well-being of our primary school pupils? For what has what has this the impact has been leaving them because of the COVID nineteen pandemic? Well, it, Justin, with respect on it, we've got it. We've got a budget out of the executive. Uh, to be fair, not just to the department but the executive as a whole. It can't you know if we're saying actually. First of all, that is actually largely speaking to uh, use, for instance, in terms of the Engage programme, to use particularly people from the substitute list to be able to come in and do additional elements of that. Now, if you're saying, for instance, should it be a pound per day and we had 120 million, if the executive was willing to give me 120 million, believe me, there are ways that I'm sure I can, I can spend 120 million. I may not, so sure. on Engage, for instance, be able to find the personnel to be able to do all of that in terms of that. So 
you know, there is a, a level we would all like to do uh, more. There will be limitations according to what the level of, of budget. And I think that the Engage program is one overall in terms of investment, which has been widely welcomed and indeed gets good reception, I think, from any schools that, 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 that I've been at. Okay. I think the Minister, I'd be, I'd be concerned about that where you're, you're saying that uh, we're, we're giving all the resources necessary to ensure that no kids are left further behind us now come with this one down. You're telling me 10 people a day for engage on well being no, behind. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm saying something slightly different. I'm sure. saying we're giving a level of resources. We're giving all the resources that, that uh, are available. That is a different thing from saying that. that all that is necessary. You know, as I said, Skills, yeah. if, if the executive was to give me a hundred million pounds, I can spend a hundred million okay, million we've pounds. Made, we've made those but there, but, but there are to, massive, there are massive yeah. pressures in terms of what they're in terms of public finance. Thanks, you William. Be real as well. Sorry, thank, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks the Minister. Bill. I need to bring uh, William Humphrey in. William, are you there? <coughs> yeah. Thanks, um, William. Can I join with others in um, thanking uh, our school leaders and teachers uh, and staff at schools? Uh, and indeed those governors have to make very difficult decisions throughout this year, an unprecedented year. Uh, and, I, and I do think uh, as well, we do need to give some consideration to the decisions that ministers can make, all ministers, because all ministers make difficult decisions. And I think sometimes politicians are very keen to criticise ministers who are out with their parties. And I think we need to bear that in mind. Can I agree uh, as well and join with others in... Uh, welcoming Barry Mahong and wishing him well his new appointment as the chair of the Education Authority and Sharon, thank uh, Sharon O'Connor for her uh, contribution. Minister, can I just say, um, speaking to go uh, school as a governor and also to speaking to principals in my area, I think one of the things that uh, would be really important is that when we go into the new year is early decisions being made and the quick and effective sharing of information is, is crucial for those in leadership at schools, and I, I would just make that point. Um, but I just wanted to tease out a wee bit more what you were saying earlier on there in terms of advice, um, in terms of issues that you were talking about, in terms of advice from CCA and school leaders. Can you expand on, on the sort of advice uh, and the, the, the consultation you've been carrying out with those around those issues? Right, we, we've been working, CCA I suppose drew up a um, sort of a long list I suppose almost every degree of options. There's been various bits of discussions. There's been iterations of those. That is most specifically, we have a stakeholder group of school principals representing all the, the different sectors. They have, this has been talked through with them on a number of, of occasions because, again, sometimes the, the menu will change a little bit in that regard. Uh, sometimes there's an iterative process uh, as a result of that. So uh, that is where I, I should say as well, yeah, I agree with you in terms of early decisions and where it is possible we always try and get very decisions sometimes these are things which would lie outside completely of the i mean sorry the, our full control of it will not necessarily be with de i suppose just the other point i should make uh succinctly because i had admitted to do that earlier on um is to join i think with others in um welcoming by mulholland to the position of chair of, of ea and also thanking um and wishing sharon o'connor uh, all the best for her years of service with, with the education authority as well the other issue I'd like to, to um, draw attention to um, our party colleague, who, uh, Nicola Werner, who is a local councillor here, also manages uh, integrated services in Greater Shankill. And speaking to her and speaking to school principals over the last number of weeks, um, I am increasingly concerned around the issue of um, general well-being and mindfulness going forward. Uh, I think that's something which uh, we all know is uh, a huge problem anyway and in, in my constituency in North Belfast and British Angle uh, is the other pandemic um, and what work has been done by government, government agencies and community in terms of response to those things but I do think given the, the, the huge pressures and, and significant change of life and not for the most of it positive that COVID has brought to many homes across Northern Ireland we do need to be focused in a joined up way uh, around these issues. Can I just ask you, what work is your department doing with Department of Health, Public Health Authority, communities, local councils, uh, and um, the, the, the wider community in terms of consulting with, with governors and so on, around the issue of general um, mindfulness and, and, and well-being 
going forward because this is going to be a huge issue. Well, uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think there's, there will be ongoing work. I suppose, directly speaking, there's been two interventions. One has happened already, one will be due to happen. Uh, directly as regards to the, there was obviously funding that's been made available, if you like, in response to the COVID side on the broader mental health and wellbeing of five million, quarter of a million of that went into youth services, the remainder went directly into schools. And there is a level of flexibility, even around mindfulness, around a range of things where that, that can be spent. But also the intention will be that there has been money allocated within budget, which will be rolled out on an annual basis that, that the health has also contributed to of about six and a half million that will be mainstreamed within within budget that can go on, on mental health. Because there is, it, it's, it's also, I suppose, uh, part of the issue is that even particularly as regards individuals, it, it's not just a one size fits all for individuals as well, as you'll appreciate. I mean, one of the things I've, I've, I've got back from a lot of schools I've been at is actually they've said the general resilience of the children has actually been quite amazing. But that perhaps masks also where there be individual cases and maybe not necessarily the people that are always known to health or education. It's also sometimes what happens within families behind closed doors. And we need to try and tackle that, that as well. Okay, uh, Chair, Chair, that's me. And I'll have to leave the meeting shortly for reasons I outlined to the clerk earlier. Thank you, Thank Thanks, you, Minister. Thank you, William. Uh, final member is uh, Morris. Morris Bradley. You there, Morris? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, Chair, can you hear me? Can indeed. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, I'd uh, like to thank the Minister and his team for, for appearing here today, and it's a wee bit robust, the question. So uh, I, I will not want to have preamble or will I attack. However, uh, I would just say to the Minister that the greatest asset any organisation has is its staff often overworked and overlooked, uh, but nonetheless the greatest asset. And I would echo the previous speakers, uh, gratitude to your teachers and helpers for their exceptional work and very trying circumstances. Minister, uh, as you know, I have concerns about the transfer test. While I remain in favour of, of, of the transfer test, I believe there needs to be a reform on how it is delivered. However, uh, given that we are still in the midst of a pandem pandemic, will the department be giving uh, support to those who are organising and taking the transfer test that includes guidance to boards of governors to ensure safety. Yeah, there, there has been guidance that have been issued, and as part of that, particularly that on, if we take both in the sense of saying to them in terms of, as was raised, I think, um, at the assembly yesterday, that they, they have been indicated that they should have a sort of wide range of criteria which are put in place. I think that's due probably at the end of this week for schools, while it's their choice. But also, I think advice has been given in terms of health and safety. We've written to both the schools themselves who will be hosting it, but also then the, the test providers. And there is an expectation that uh, with examinations that the, the range of um, sort of health mitigations that need to be put in place will be the same um, on any set of, of examinations, whether they are at transfer test level, whether they at GCSE A level, et cetera. There are two letters that have been sent to the providers of the test um, about the need to follow the public health guidance and uh, specifically you know, how they're going to deal with pupils from different primary schools and class bubbles. Mm -hmm. And then wrote again last week to advising the test providers that they you know, must ensure that they're uh, uh, complying with the requirements of the health protection legislation and outlined the need to be able to provide the details of the advice that they've sought and the assessment of risk undertaken by them and host schools and to make sure that they're very clear in uh, advising parents of the steps that they've taken and the mitigations that have been put in place. Just one, one final question, Chair, and it's, uh, uh, would the department be providing any additional support to help the teaching staff uh, during the track and trace and guidance to ensure that the tests are done in a safe manner? Well, I mean, don't forget, these are ultimately our, our private tests in, in relation to that. If there is an identification, the normal procedure, if there was somebody then at later stage was identified that required sort of test and trace on it. But, uh, you know, ultimately, if, if schools are providing us, we've given them advice on what they need to have in, in place. These are ultimately private tests, so the responsibility will lie with, with those who are actually, they're making a choice, if you like, to do these tests. Consequently, I suppose they've, they've got to deal with with ensuring that all the consequences are, are put in place as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Minister. That's me, Chair. Thank, thank, thanks, Morris. Um, it's, Minister, is it, is it possible for these tests to be delivered within public health guidance? Yeah. 
Well, you know, don't forget, at the end of the day, we're in a situation where um, we're talking about, in any one particular occasion, accommodation of about 10,000, roughly, on each individual occasion, uh, pupils coming in. Whereas in a normal school day, there will be about a third of a million. And, and some in bubbles that don't leave that bubble for the whole day. Have you sought the well, advice yeah, of the don't, chief? Don't as, part of, as part of the, the public health guidance and part of the, the indications that what are happening by the test organisation, they are as much. They will be actually ensuring that the children who are actually doing the test are doing so within uh, within their own bubbles, within legislation. And yeah, it's all. Everything will be complied with. Um, certainly, the guidance we've given is to ensure that everything is, is complied with in terms of public health terms. Okay, so I mean, you've obviously sought guidance in terms of the impact of a uh, an early cessation of school-based learning um, on R. Have you sought advice from the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical well, officer with regards to the potential impact on the R rate of the setting of these tests? Well, given given the fact, what's it? The duty of care is on the providers. Yeah, I mean, first of all, the duty of care is on is on the providers. Whenever you say we have sought, I mean, look, what I'm saying is in terms of the R rate, the health advisors who will be there, particularly at the executive, will will always give a level of assessment on what various aspects of life will have impact in terms of our, I think, issues were raised just in terms of um, the range of measures, not just within schools but beyond that that we there in terms of ours. So that will be. Constantly, the, the, the duty is, is on that. But in terms of the issue of our, I mean, look, again, we're talking about, uh, generally speaking, a gathering across a wide range of, of settings of about 10,000 pupils, when on each day there will be a third of a million uh, pupils that will be gathering, um, you know, within that. So I don't see how that will be, but the risk assessment is, is ultimately one for those who are actually conducting the test themselves. Okay, Minister. Final, final question for me. I realise you've you've given us a fair yeah. a fair wind of time here. In, in, in terms of in terms of the, the the consideration of of any cessation of of school based learning prior to Friday the eighteenth of December, did, did you even scope um, different options? You obviously have the stakeholders forum, the practitioners forum, the secondary students union available to you. Have you even scoped you know one day, two day? Um, cessation of school-based learning um, with special schools remaining open or schools remaining open for key workers. Have you scoped any of those options no, I mean, or are you adamant yeah, that, that is, schools will remain yeah, open it, as late it, as the week commencing the 21st of December? Chair, sure, it, it's hard to see that, that uh, logically from, from a point of view, given where periods of self-isolation would be, it is hard to see how particularly a one-day or two-day difference we'd make. And schools aren't given a level of flexibility in terms of already, in terms of their overall school year. The important thing is that, uh, that schools remain uh, open for their, their pupils, that they provide that face-to-face -face, uh, learning uh, on, that, on that basis. So, you know, I've made it very clear that I think schools need to remain open. That has been the consistent position. So okay. Okay. On, that, on that note, Chair, uh, maybe I, I appreciate at various stages, there have been different levels of, of um, views expressed by both myself and committee members. But as I suppose, strictly speaking, this will be the last time I'll be in front of the committee. Prior to it, can I wish uh, the uh, committee, all the committee members, um, even even those who are, are um, uh, biting at me at times on it, I wish them a very um, yeah. happy Christmas, and I hope everything is uh, goes well for everyone. Yeah, and, and obviously, obviously, you've referenced that. I hope that you'll be making an announcement next week with regards to yeah. examination. So, hope, hopefully, it won't be the last time we see you before Christmas. No, no, I, 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 I thoroughly enjoy our, in our interaction, Peter. In that, I, should, I should say, obviously, in this forum and not on that, on that basis on it. So, um, and, and, and look, general, if, if, if the committee, if the committee Peter, want to. Very if the committee ahead. want to email me privately with what what each of you want as Christmas presents, I'm sure. Um, uh, Mine's running away. I, I'm not. I, I know. I know. I know. Sort of. Uh, Danny. Danny may well be sending me. We, well, may, maybe send, sending uh, Santa at the Department of Education a very long list, which would probably involve issues around examinations and a range of other uh, activities. But look, I wish everybody. I will be seeing you at the assembly next week yeah. uh, on that yeah. basis. On it, and I wish everybody. A, yeah. A, uh, and Minister, in, time, Christmas. in closing for me, we've, we've obviously set out clearly and consistency, consistently what we think some of those key issues are for you to, to yeah. seriously um, take, take action on in, in, 
in, in weeks uh, rather than, than months. And we do look forward to getting greater clarity with regards to examinations um, from you next week. And we've, we've made our views clear in relation to the, what, what we feel is the importance of that uh, cessation of school-based learning adequately in advance of Christmas to ensure teaching, non-teaching staff, pupils who have sacrificed much over the last period of time, they they have the Christmas that they deserve. But we do sincerely wish you uh, and your departmental staff um, rest over that period of time as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, members, uh, can I ask uh, Assembly Broadcasting um, to bring members uh, back into the spotlight and to ask the clerk to summarise uh, any actions we need to take. Uh, thanks, Chairperson. While well, just waiting for members to join the spotlight and the department to leave. Um, so again, uh, this is where members will jump in and see uh, what I've missed out. So it appears that the committee wishes to write to the department, um, urging uh, the provision of clarity on examinations and encouraging engagement with uh, students uh, and, uh, and schools in that regard. Clark, can I supplement that very briefly? Because we just ran out of time on questions there. But can we ask if the Deloitte independent mm -hmm. review mm -hmm. of examinations 2020 has been received and if SIA recommendations have been received. I presume they have if the Minister hopes to make a further statement to the Assembly next week on that matter but it might be helpful to get clarity in that regard and I suppose um, when they, if and when they would be made available to the committee. We were told six weeks. Okay, oh. sorry that, I raise we're tight for time here as well Clark so I'll let you, let you get through there. And uh, then Additionally, then, uh, the committee wishes to write to the department seeking clarity on the advice and support which will be provided to school leaders running up to and over Christmas in respect of track and trace. Um, perhaps the committee wants to write to the department to ask it to set out the position, re those schools which have offered students the option of working remotely. Yep. Um, additionally, then, uh, seeking clarity on vocational and technical qualifications which are undertaken <coughs> by some pupils in schools. Um, looking for further information on the timing of payments to the childcare providers, as Ms Brogan also asked, and site of guidance to the schools and test providers in respect of the health mitigations relating to the post-primary transfer testing. Um, yeah, can I, I'll add and then bring you, can, I think you mentioned clarity with regards to um, track and tracing responsibilities and when they will cease for um, teaching staff. Can I also add a question again, didn't have time to ask in detail, um, why no code to record uh, COVID-related pupil absence has been yeah. created? Um, and bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen and I think Robin as well. Yeah. Yep. On that, um, the one on the transfer test, uh, see in relation to the track and trace that's in place, whose responsibility is it? Is it the private providers? The, the primary school principal that the child comes from or the school where the test has taken place. So maybe clarity on that and maybe just for um, uh, details around that vaccination list around um, school staff being added to the vaccination list. Is the committee, sorry, uh, Deputy Chair, is the committee taking the view then that um, school staff should be... Um, mm -hmm. I own that list. I, th I, I think keep bringing in people I think that's here. Important, Daniel, you want to come uh, in on that? I think that's an important uh, suggestion, <coughs> simply because uh, teachers have been and are continuing to be directly exposed to large groups of young people uh, who at a time were considered as super spreaders of this virus, although that is, hasn't been heard in some weeks and months. Uh, I do think it is important to uh, ensure the safety and to uh, uh, ease the anxiety within the teaching profession that that, that suggestion is supported. Uh, I, I don't see why not. They are absolutely uh, on the front line and they're providing an invaluable service and in educating our children in these most challenging times. And also childcare staff as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think you meant that. Yep. Thanks. Members Sorry. content. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Yep. Bring in Robin Newton as well. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Uh, it's really a, you raised the point about. Uh, principals making their decisions already. Can we just try to understand what flexibility school principals have in the area, Peter? In respect of uh, school closure? Yes, or, or remote, remote learning, learning or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. whatever. Yes. Um, if we can just try to understand that. Uh, and uh, um, Ms. Bruggen uh, raised the issue uh, following me. In terms of the um, 
A letter from the Minister dated the 3rd of December on the Child Care Support Fund and he's indicated that he has. Uh, is he, he is intending uh, to announce further funding for the scheme. If we could maybe try to understand, I, know, I think he said the figures have gone past me. Yeah. How much that is and when that money might indeed uh, be, be, be allocated. Thanks, Chairperson. Okay. Uh, no, ju just to, Daniel? Uh, yeah, um, in relation to track and trace, uh, I think all of us are receiving considerable concern in, uh, uh, in relation to the heavy workload uh, in that regard. Uh, I don't think we've got any extra resource to help support the school uh, in that. And it, it can take <coughs> a significant period of time uh, for a, a principal or a teacher to see that out. So I'm just wondering, is there merit in asking for resources in that regard? It, it has added a huge amount of work to an already very difficult situation. And to ask the department and the minister's assessment whether support for contact tracing for principals and teaching staff has been adequate, and indeed what it is. Uh, Clerk, I have a, I, I did ask that. There's a question on. Yeah. Um, I suppose I was told at the time the best person to do track and trace was the principal. So I went back then and asked for extra resources Thanks. for the principal. All our duties the principal carry out. So I think there's a. It's been asked That's a few times. The members are no, right. there's a. Yeah. There's an answer there, but it's probably not the answer we wanted to hear. No, I mean, probably. <laughs> but it's a big issue. Ah. Okay. Any other actions, Clark? No. Our, no. Our just chair, uh, Daniel. In terms of school closure, and all of us are getting inundated in relation to that that issue, and also the, the huge debate around it as to how it will impact on SEN children and people that are in work and everything else. But I suppose the best approach would be f flexibility to allow schools to close. So I'm just wondering. Um, have we a position collectively as a committee on this, or what, what is the...? I, 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 I tried to ask my, my last question at the end there to see what, whether options had been scoped. It might, if we get into the realm of, of, yeah. of a specific option here, I think it might, be, it might be challenging, but I think it would have been, for my position, and, and this is not to be confrontational, I, I think it would have been helpful to to hear whether any type of those options had been scoped, because yeah. I, th I think most members have acknowledged that um, uh, partial school closure yeah. does have implications for um, vulnerable children, does have implications for uh, key worker families, for example, with hospitals under or over capacity and under significant pressure. But um, I, I don't get the impression that those different options were scoped from yeah. The answers that are received today. So, um, have, have we an action in that regard in relation, or, or have we, the, we the, feel like we've asked our questions today? Regrettably, the, the reason I've asked that is, yeah. is because of Peter's, the minister's letter to schools that has added pressure on those who are in a place where they feel that the schools should close. Now, ultimately, it will be their decision, but it has added uh, a, an extra layer of pressure. I think a, a flexible approach is probably best, and what is mm -hmm. best in the best interest of the school uh, and the circumstances of the school and the pupils and the teachers. Um, uh, but I think the letter from the Minister this week has been unhelpful and that it has added pressure to them. Uh, and that, that, has, that is why we are getting inundated with people calling for schools to close on the 11th, yeah, a view yeah. which I share completely. But in terms of um, how we go forward, I, I, I think that um, this is, well, we're running out of time now anyway. Cause yeah, we're no, I, I, I agree. I, I, I think some cessation of school-based learning um, should have occurred. And as I made clear, we're now, um, we're now uh, behind England, who has announced today that that cessation will occur from Thursday the 17th of December. And yet we're told today some schools may be may require pupils to attend as late as the week commencing Monday the 21st December. I, I don't think we're going to get a, a committee position on this issue, but could I perhaps propose a, an action that we, we do request further detail with regards to what options were scoped or if any flexibility is being scoped, and maybe tie that into the question with regards to what flexibility is available to schools who may wish to move to um, remote learning themselves, which I think creates its own challenges, to be honest, but um, yeah, I think that's, is that a fair yeah. action? Yeah. yeah, so so basically, what options does the Minister consider around potential closures, uh, early closures, and uh, why he has made the decision to keep schools open? 
explain that? Should we ask him to explain that? I, I think he has I set out his position. Um, I, 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 I think I think it would be useful to know what options were scoped yeah. and, and if any flexibility um, exists <coughs> for schools who wish to um, move to remote learning in advance of the scheduled closure date. Is that fair enough? I think Indeed. that's included in what Robin. Yeah, put yeah, out. we can attach it to that. So yeah, can attach it to that members. Yeah. Independent Sage has also called for this. Do you remember? And they've made some very critical and clear points in relation to why the argument for uh, uh, flexible closing or early closing uh, is so uh, important, yeah. particularly given the situation in most schools. Okay. Yeah, John, I haven't seen the indicative timings for next week, but uh, do we know when the ministers? Not on the indicative timings oh, yet, but they, these would be late anyway. That would appear on Friday or something. Uh, okay. okay, and the members will make their own positions on those issues yeah. very yeah. clear publicly, I'm sure, as we as we have been doing. Okay, Clark. Members content? Okay, if we can move to, to agenda item six, um, another vital briefing on uh, seclusion, restraint, and restrictive practice from the British Association of social workers. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and add the witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 123, a paper from uh, BASWNI at page 130, a related Assembly Research paper at 132, and Education and Training Inspectorate 2013 report into challenging behaviour in special schools at page 152. Other related correspondence from page 167. And can I welcome then Carolyn Yurt, Director of the British Association of Social Workers, Northern Ireland, and Andy McLenahan, Communications and Public Affairs Officer for the British Association of Social Workers, Northern Ireland. And by way of welcome, can I say that the, the committee has uh, allocated uh, some uh, time to this uh, issue for a, a, a number of months, and we have received. Um, uh, correspondence uh, from very concerned parents um, with regards to restrictive practice in schools. Um, we know it's something that has been progressed in our other jurisdictions, but uh, not yet in Northern Ireland in terms of more up-to-date guidance on this matter. And the committee is therefore glad to engage with the British Association of Social Workers uh, on this important matter. Can I advise uh, uh, witnesses that you have around 10 minutes to make an opening statement and then we'll follow that by question from the members. I think over to Carolyn and Andy. Can Andy hear us? Yes? Chair, I can hear you. I can't hear Carolyn. Okay. Who, oh, I can't hear her. Who's, is Carolyn starting? <coughs> Carolyn was to start, yes. Yeah. Maybe she's muted. Carolyn, muted, maybe? Apologies, can you hear me now? It's a bit grainy, but go ahead and we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll be okay there. The joys of, uh, of digital technology. Can you hear? I'm going to try and adjust some speakers on my headphones. Yeah, that, see if that makes a difference. That, that, would, be help. Help. that would be helpful. It, it, it is... It is uh, Digital sounding at the moment. Uh, I don't don't think we'd be able to uh, proceed with that sound level at the moment. Okay. Does that make any difference for you, Chair? Not, not. No, I don't think so. <coughs> Maybe okay. Come Let's come back see. In. Yeah, it might be helpful. I can hear you all very clearly, but there's something clearly going around. Here. Any better? Slight, slightly better. Try again. No. No, we've lost you. Saying it, saying it again. Uh. Did, did Andy? Did you have comments as well? Could we maybe take your comments and then try and get Carolyn logged out and logged back in again? Um. Certainly. There's a. Um, Carolyn, would you be happy if I spoke to your opening statement? Would that be, be okay. would that be okay? That'd be great. Yeah. Sorry about that, Carolyn. Okay. But hopefully we'll get you we'll get you fixed there. Thanks, Andy. Okay, no problem. So I'll, I'll just uh, I'll turn to this, Mr. Chairman, committee members. 
Thanks very much for the invitation to present this morning. Um, as you know, I'm Andy McLennan, Basel in Northern Ireland Communications and Public Affairs Officer, and Carolyn Ewart, our National Director, is also going to be giving evidence. I'm going to briefly outline Basel Northern Ireland's position on the use of restrictive practices, seclusion and restraint, and then I will go on to explain a little bit about what we feel should be put in place to, to actually remove the need for use of restrictive practices in, a, in, in the vast majority of contexts. Then we'll be happy to take some questions. So for a little bit of background on BASWA, um, we are, BASWA Northern Ireland is part of BASWA UK, the largest professional body for social workers um, in the UK, and we have 21,000 members uh, employed across all areas of social work practice. In Northern Ireland, there's approximately 6,600 registered social workers. Um, they, the majority of them work in the statutory health and social care sector. Social workers also work in the education sector in various roles, including the Education Authority, Education Welfare Service and Child Protection Support Service. Social workers also work in the criminal and youth justice sectors, in the voluntary sector and as independent practitioners. So as we're in Northern Ireland, we first became involved with this issue when a member of ours who co-authored a report was contacted by concerned parents. Um, the report is Three Steps to Positive Practice. Um, it's a, right, uh, a rights-based approach, um, which is to be used when considering and reviewing the use of restrictive interventions. The document was jointly produced by the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the Royal College of Nursing, and the Royal College of OTs, sorry, the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. Um, Basel Northern Ireland, as an association, could not take on individual cases, but we decided to explore the wider social work issues raised and to review the policy and guidance. So in, in short, Basel Northern Ireland is concerned at the lack of standardised policies and guidance from the Department of Education regarding the use of restrictive practices and seclusion with children and young people with additional needs, including those with physical or learning disabilities. The association recognises the damaging physical, psychological and emotional effects that restraint and seclusion can have on children and young people. And we note that the emotional impacts of these practices are often felt by the families of the children and young people involved. The department's existing guidance on the use of reasonable force to restrain pupils, it focuses on the use of restraint in the context of good order and discipline. However, where a child or young person with additional needs exhibits a behavior which is considered to be challenging, it's important that the approach taken centers on meeting the child's individual needs. Addressing the behavior from a stance solely focused on maintaining discipline is going to fail to meet the needs of the children and young people involved. So Basel Northern Ireland has called for mandatory training for all staff working directly with children and young people with additional needs. And we recommend that interventions should be therapeutic in outcome and focus on positive behavior support strategies with restraint used only as a last resort option. Basel Northern Ireland is opposed to the use of seclusion, that is the isolation of a child or young person away from others in a room or area from which they are prevented from leaving. But it's important to stress that it should be recognised, however, that there is a significant difference between the legitimate use of a quiet space away from other children, where a child can voluntarily go as part of an agreed behaviour support plan or in an emergency situation for the prevention of harm. And, and that's to be um, clearly distinguished from a room where a child is locked in by themselves and unable to leave. The department's guidance on positive behaviour support strategies um, needs to be produced in, sorry, any forthcoming departmental guidance on positive behaviour support strategies needs to be produced in partnership with parents and all other relevant stakeholders. And it should define what constitutes a last resort scenario in which restraint may be used. The guidance should be distributed to all staff working directly with children and young people with additional needs as part of their mandatory training. Basel Northern Ireland would also support the introduction of mandatory recording and reporting of all incidents of restrictive practice and seclusion. Records of cases of restriction and seclusion should be shared with the parents and guardians of the children or young people involved, as well as with the school board, education authority, the Department of Education and the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. While restraint or seclusion has been employed, a meeting should uh, between the school and the child or young person's parents or guardians should be convened to consider the incident. And the discussion should cover what prior interventions were employed to de-escalate the incident and to examine what strategies will be put in place to minimize the need for seclusion or restraint in future. 
Now, investigating safeguarding concerns resulting from restraint and seclusion is a role for social workers, and it is essential that schools, the education authority and the department engage fully in social work investigations of any such concerns. But Basman Northern Ireland believes, however, that guidance for schools should be developed by the department to ensure that as a first step, there is a thorough, open and time-bound investigation of complaints raised by parents prior to social service involvement. Basman Northern Ireland to date has met with the Department for Education and the Education Authority to raise the issues that I've just presented to you now. And we've also had discussions with the Ch Commissioner for Children and Young People in Northern Ireland. We have also sought engagement with the five teachers unions to discuss the measures we are calling for, but we haven't had any conversations since we reached out to the teaching unions. I'll just move on to the, the, the second statement that I was to read out um, following on from Carolyn's. Um, so I've stressed that we, we advocate that the use of restrictive practices should only be used in last resort scenarios. But I think, you know, if we're going to avoid the use of restraint and appropriately meet children and young people's needs, there needs to, we need to take several steps back in the process to ensure that support is delivered um, in what we consider to be a preventative low arousal context. It's really important that if we're going to avoid the use of restraint, that um, the support needs of individuals are anticipated and any potential challenges that might be posed um, uh, can be addressed um, so that restraint and seclusion can be replaced with person-centered therapeutic interventions that focus on improving the well-being of the child or young person. And in considering how children and young people are supported in special educational settings, it's really vital, and this is something we'll probably stress a number of times today, it's really vital to remember that all behaviour is communication. So this is especially relevant when considering the needs of children and young people who are non-verbal. Behaviour that challenges, it needs to be recognised that behaviour that challenges may signal a need for support, and it's essential to understand that it, its underlying causes. The UK government um, has produced non-statutory guidance um, for England um, for healthcare settings and for special educational settings. And that guidance focuses on reducing the need for restraint and restrictive intervention. And it recognises that behaviour which challenges could be the result of a medical condition or a sensory impairment. It could be the result of previous trauma or neglect, or it could be exacerbated by an unmet physiological need or an undiagnosed medical condition. Um, a behaviour which challenges may also reflect the challenges of communication or the frustrations faced by children and young people with learning disabilities, autistic spectrum conditions and mental health difficulties um, who also may have little choice and control over their lives. Uh, I previously mentioned low arousal approaches. What that means, that includes interaction, diffusion and distraction strategies that focus on reducing stress, fear and frustration. And very importantly, they're aimed at preventing aggression in crisis situations. Low arousal approaches, they will identify triggers and use low intensity strategies and solutions to avoid punitive consequences for children who are distressed. Um, Basel Northern Ireland, we're concerned that the training currently provided to teachers and support staff in Northern Ireland may not focus sufficiently on de-escalation training and low arousal approaches, and this can lead to unnecessary use of restraint and seclusion. The result is that what should be used as a last resort only in crisis situations is being used over frequently without regulation, without recording and without reporting to parents and families. I'll finish there. Is Carolyn, is Carolyn back with us? Hello, Anthony, can you hear me? Um, it's still all about Yeah, you, it's, it's a good comparison. <laughs> I'm not sure what else I can do at this stage. Um, it's impossible to make my mind say. Because you can't even hold them. I hear you. I, 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 I can make out what you're saying, just as Andy said, it, it's it's uh, extremely close to Dalek uh, from Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, that, that's, I think, I think we have some games. <laughs> I think, Something to do with her headphones. Oh, Something to do with the headphones, potentially. Sorry, Paula, what's that? You're just typing away furiously. Oh, um, if she uses um, the phone line and phones in, okay. Okay. we'll be able to hear her, but just not see her. Okay, okay. The, uh, an alternative option, line. Carolyn, might be to phone in and use the, the phone line. I think, uh, Andy, you've, you've covered all the, the opening comments um, that Basra wanted to make, though. Is that, is that right? Yes? That's right, that's right, yes. 
full indeed. Um, and uh, perhaps if there are key, if, if if we can't get the phone line option working for Carolyn, we we can we can hear what you're saying. It, it is just not in normal audio uh, sound. So if there's a if there is a key point that you would like to make, perhaps we can persist with that as well. But are, are you content for us to move to questions at, at this stage, Andy? Can we just hold on, uh, Chair, until Carolyn is connected? Would yeah, that, that be okay? Okay. Should, Clark, should we take a short uh, break? Yeah. Oh, that, let's take a, a, a very, very uh, two-minute short break here to see if we can resolve those issues for Carolyn. But thank you for a really helpful opening statement. Um, Andy, thank you. No problem. You're welcome. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members and witnesses, that's us return to public session. Um, Carolyn, I think we've, we have resolved the uh, audio gremlins and we're delighted to have you back with us. Um, Carolyn and Andy, thank you both uh, for that extremely helpful opening statement. Um, can I uh, ask a, a first uh, set of questions um, by asking, are there, uh, are there approaches that have been taken uh, to update uh, guidance in relation to restrictive practice? Uh, seclusion and restraint in other jurisdictions that could be a useful template for what updated guidance ought to uh, look like in Northern Ireland. Um, ask that of, of Andy and Carla. Andy, do you want to take that? Yes, no problem. Sorry, Jerry, your audio got a bit um, vague there, but I think I got the, the, the gist of the question. Yes, there is. There's government guidance issued um, for England. Um, it was produced in 2019 on reducing the need for restraint and restrictive intervention. And although that was very welcome that that guidance was produced, there are some shortcomings with it. It's, um, it's non-statutory guidance, um, which I think is limits um, it's, um, how, how useful it can be. It also only applies in um, special educational settings and healthcare settings. It doesn't apply in mainstream schools which limits its, its, its usefulness as well. I think some of the shortcomings of the UK guidance are also that it, it's, it places quite a responsibility on the professional judgment of teachers to decide if restraint is necessary, reasonable and proportionate. Um, and we believe as Basel Northern Ireland that any guidance introduced in Northern Ireland should exceed this standard and have a comprehensive but non-exhaustive list of examples of when restraint should be used. Because our concern is if you leave, if you leave the decision solely to the professional judgment um, of individual teaching staff that can allow significant room for interpretation of the standards which could lead to an unnecessary and avoidable use of restraint. I think also the English guidance it, it places an unfair responsibility on teachers because it it says to be to be confident in their judgment I'm just quoting directly from it to be confident in their judgment staff should also ensure that they know the scope of the legal powers authorizing restraint keep abreast of changes to and, and developments in the understanding of what constitutes good practice in this area. I don't think that's appropriate at all. Um, to ensure staff are adequately resourced and supported to minimise the use of restrictive practices, it's absolutely essential that staff in Northern Ireland are fully trained in the use of positive behaviour support strategies and um, that they have an alternative approach and that the Department for Education and the Education Authority are held responsible for ensuring staff are kept up to date with developments on what is considered good practice to put that responsibility on to individual teachers, I think is very lacking and, and not fair to those, those staff. In Scotland, interestingly, the Scottish government is in the process of developing guidance um, for the use uh, on the use of restraint and seclusion. The Scottish government has actually, this came about um, as a result of a judicial review, which was um, supported by the Scottish Equality and Human Rights Commission. If the committee wants to look into it in more detail, the Children's Commissioner, Children and Young People's Commissioner in Scotland has a fantastic report. I think it's 2018. It's called No Safe Place. And it examines the use of restraint and seclusion across um, schools in Scotland. And the engagement there is with, um, uh, Scot with uh, local authorities, given their responsibility for education. We find some really worrying inconsistencies in terms of a lack of policies um, in different uh, across the different local authorities. They found that um, the implementation, uh, oh, sorry, the, the the situation in Scotland uh, and the lack of guidance centrally, um, it risks violating various different aspects of human rights law. It flagged up issues around the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. 
But as I understand, the judicial review taken forward um, and supported by the um, Scottish Equality and Human Rights Commission focused on Articles 3, 5 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights because it's the ECHR which is implemented um, via the, the UK Human Rights Act. So that is what is applicable in UK law. So Article 3, that focuses on the prohibition of torture, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. Article 5 focuses on the right to liberty and security. And Article 8 focuses on the right to respect for private life, which includes respect for physical integrity. So the Scottish guidance, which is in the process of being developed, will have a very strong, as I understand, human rights basis. And we think that something similar, a similar approach needs to be taken in Northern Ireland. That's helpful, Andy. So that there is a significant body of work there that um, the Department of Education uh, and other stakeholders can draw from. I noticed that you said a, a limitation of the England guidance was non-statutory in nature. You, you believe that new guidance in Northern Ireland should be statutory in nature then, yeah? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that, yeah. Uh, like can, I, can I maybe just check that everyone else who isn't speaking is on mute, as there's quite a bit of significant background noise? Okay, um, just, just, just to reiterate, if everyone who is not speaking could be muted, there is a significant amount of background noise there. So, Andy, I was, I was saying... Um, you think, therefore, that the uh, Northern Irish guidance should be statutory in nature? Yes, and I would also just comment that the Scottish guidance is non-statutory guidance. I think my understanding is that their plan is to introduce non-statutory guidance with, a, with that to be reviewed to, to, um, down the line to see how, how useful it's actually been. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think it would be, it, just in terms of Northern Ireland, though, I wouldn't, our position would be that the introduction of non-statutory guidance would be a good thing in the short term. I think if we were to wait for the introduction of statutory guidance, given how long it could take for the legislation to pass, it would be remiss to wait until legislation was passed to have guidance introduced. I think it's really important that if you're going to actually engender any sort of cultural shift in terms of how um, people operate in any big institution, and if we think of the education sector as an institution, in that context, it's very important that you shape um, uh, the culture through uh, training, engagement and guidance. And if we just wait to have legislation passed, that's going to take a long time, but it also may not have the, um, all, of the intended all of the intended benefits that we'd be looking for. Fair enough. And in terms of uh, ne action necessary to bring forward up-to-date standardised guidance in Northern Ireland, can you... Uh, give the committee an idea of what work is underway. I know that the Department of Education, Children's Commissioner, Northern Ireland um, Public Service Ombudsman um, have, have initiated work in that regard. Is that right? Karen, would you like to go ahead with that? Yes, I'll take that on, Is that okay? Um, Chair, happy to report that that is the case. I mean, I, I would like to say it at, at this stage, thank you all for your patience and understanding um, with, with difficulties. It's nice to be able to, to speak with you. Um, I would also want, I think, to, to acknowledge the, the huge amount of work that, that families um, have been doing in, in relation to this area for some time. And those are families of children who've been you know, directly impacted. Um, we, we've had involvement, I suppose, over the last sort of uh, 12 months or so uh, in trying to look at the issues. And Andy has, has set those out very clearly in, in his earlier briefings. Um, we, we've had actually now two meetings with um, Department for Education and the Education Authority, um, our first one back in September and um, uh, a second one just last week. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, or our first meeting, you know, we, we, the 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 um, the officials were were very clear that they were uh, initiating on on the request of the minister a very broad ranging review, uh, and were open to all the suggestions that that we'd been making in relation to uh, the need for for guidance. Uh, there was an openness, I think, to to consider um, statute and the use of legislation if that was required. Uh, and an openness and willingness to, to review uh, not only you know the, the current guidance, which is, in our view, woefully outdated. I mean, 19, 1999 was the last kind of guidance um, that was had been issued um, to staff and to schools. Um, but also, uh, I think we made uh, representations that it was important that all the stakeholders uh, were involved and included uh, in that process. 
COVID, I think, and better, they'll be able to answer much better uh, than, than we will in terms of their actions. But we do recognise that COVID obviously has had a significant impact on uh, them being able to take forward the work. Uh, and obviously, um, based on you know, the, the discussion you've already had this morning, the impact on, on teaching staff, schools and children at school, I mean, has been significant. Uh, but there's a real commitment, I think, there from the department to uh, take a written branch review of, of the entire uh, system uh, and openness to look at guidance, legislation and, um, and positive behaviour approaches and models that should be used in schools. So we would be keen to be uh, part of that. We would also like to see uh, and ensure that parents and young people are, are part of that um, process as well. Um, I mean, the, the principles that are around in terms of partnership uh, and parental responsibility linked to the children's order, very clearly keen to, to have uh, those with lived experience and um, expert by experience uh, involved in a process. So we would um, absolutely support that. Uh, I think also important, uh, we understand there's, there's two separate groups. Uh, there is a, a working group, a working party, if you like, and an advisory group. Uh, we don't know the details of the membership of those groups at this stage, but we understand that we'll be asked um, as Basel Northern Ireland to be part of the advisory group. Uh, that would uh, be important. I think that teaching unions, et cetera, are involved in, in that group uh, alongside parents. Um, and the, uh, the working group, uh, I suppose it's for the department to decide that the makeup of that group, but important that it's inclusive um, and involves all the people who um, have a legitimate um, voice in the process. That's great, thank you. <laughs> Helpful information. Can I bring Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA in? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Caroline and Andy. And Caroline, uh, I know you had technical difficulties, but we're just sitting here admiring your beautiful tree, so it made, it made up for it. I'm so jealous because I don't think mine up yet. So, no, it was great to, to finally hear from both of you this morning. I think that both of you have um, covered uh, everything in the, in the briefing, both the briefing you've provided beforehand and today. <clears throat> And most of mine has been covered by the chair's question, so it's just really a couple of statements that I wanted to say. Like the chair had said, we have heard from a number of parents, um, and throughout this time, uh, it was something new that came to me as when I came on as the party's education spokesperson. I was very shocked by some of the horrific experiences that their children had been through, uh, and very concerned around the lack of uh, standardised guidance and policies and how I did it, that it was. But hearing from, from yourself, Caroline, in particular, that the Department and the Education Authority is working on it, because um, that was going to be one of my questions. So it's really good to hear that they're already are working, meeting, establishing the working groups and the advisory groups. So it is important to ensure that, as you say, Caroline, uh, families have been to the fore of this. They have done so much work. There is so much solutions that they have brought forward. And along with yourselves, I fully agree with all the recommendations that you, that you have brought. There's a lot of learning there, as we talked about the other jurisdictions. So it's all there. It's just around implementing it and changing it. And like Andy said, we could get started on that now. We don't have to wait for the policy and the legislation to be changed. Training is something that could be acted on immediately. Um, I would be an advocate around autism training, but believe it, it needs to go. The mandatory autism training needs to go further um, uh, and include positive behaviour strategies, but include all school staff, not just teaching staff. So uh, that is something that could be acted upon on that. Um, and also, I believe that in all of this, we need to see accountability mechanisms included, because I have to say, I was really shocked that records maybe not been shared parents not being informed, um, and uh, I would believe that our numbers here would be higher when you look at the Scottish numbers. So all of that could be started to be changed um, while we wait for the, the legislation and policy. So that's really me, Chair. So thank thank you. you both. Um, I know we have a, there's a motion coming to the Assembly soon, there's a, so there'll be a lot of debate on it then as well. So thank you both. Thanks, Karen. Robin, Robin Newton, MLX. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you uh, uh, to members for, for coming before us today. It's extremely interesting and extremely relevant. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure your own um, research has told you that the, 
uh, committee in general has been extremely supportive of uh, our special needs uh, schools uh, and indeed the special needs principals and staff uh, within the schools. I've just a, a, a couple of uh, questions. Uh, I think they're probably fairly short questions. Um, we were surprised uh, last week that uh, there were areas of teacher training uh, that didn't cover aspects of the care situation. Can you just tell us whether or not in our teacher training colleges autism is covered within the curriculum of, of, of teacher training. Can I also ask, have you had any conversations with the uh, school leadership group within the special educational needs uh, schools? And I think uh, it was Andy mentioned that you had tried to make contact with the uh, teacher teaching trade unions and, and hadn't had any response from the, the, the trade unions? Perhaps you'd let us know when that was and whether or not uh, it, that's an ongoing matter for you. Andy, do you want to just pick up the issue around the, the, the communication with the, uh, with the trade unions um, and then follow up on the other issues? Yes, not a problem. Um, if I may just... Can I, I just need to actually search back. I'm not entirely sure when we did write to the unions. It was a number of months back. Carolyn, could you address those other issues now? Come in at the end with that when I when I pull it out. Forgive me. There, Andy. Mm -hmm. my, my sense was that it was around August September time, but uh, I, I didn't. I, I wouldn't um, be able to just confirm that offhand. Um, it's an interesting question, and I suppose we, we don't actually um, know at this stage, um, Robin, what the, the training would be uh, in relation to uh, teacher training. It's, um, we represent social workers and are involved with social workers, so I can talk lots about what social work training might involve. Unfortunately, I don't have that information, but I think it would be uh, interesting, and I'm sure if this is an area that you, you choose to pursue, there'll be many people you could call who, who could give you information uh, on that. Um, I think the, the approach in relation to um, a whole school approach is, is one that's really important. And I think what we tried to say is that, you know, once the department make a decision around what the, the best approach is and look to um, set out the model that it would want to use, and I know at the moment um, it, it uses Team Teach uh, under the um, auspices of the review, that's up, I think, for discussion as well in terms of trying to find uh, the best model that really fits for Northern Ireland. And I think just to echo Andy's comments, I think there's a real aspiration here, which we would support um, to say that, you know, we should have the best possible model for the children and young people um, at our schools. Uh, and we, we make that based on ev evidence, uh, look at research, look at what we know um, are, are the best, the, the models that would provide the best outcomes for children um, that support them and nurture them and develop them um, and that don't lead to, to trauma uh, and mistrust and fear. So um, I think in, in the model that's picked uh, and the training that's required, that needs to be a whole school system. So that's not just the teachers, uh, it's the teaching staff, it's the cleaning staff, it's the, uh, the ancillary staff who support uh, in terms of driving, uh, all the, the, the individuals who come into contact uh, with children. And, and that, as we understand from, uh, from the evidence, uh, points to um, the, best, uh, the best possible outcome for, for those children. Um, if, if I may, um, uh, Mr Newton, the, the, the letters went out to the teaching unions on the 25th of September. And I'll just, just to follow on, Carolyn mentioned um, Team Teach being um, the, the training provider. I'll just point the committee to um, resources online. The British Institute of Learning Disabilities is an organisation which certifies organisations which have demonstrated that their training services comply with the Restraint Reduction Network training standards. Um, it's a pretty rigorous process and it's accredited by the United Kingdom Accreditation Service um, as meeting the ISO standards for certification. And you can check on their website organizations that have been 
um, certified in line with the restraint reduction network training standards. Um, but as of yesterday, when I checked, Team Teach was listed um, as an organisation that was working towards certification, not an organisation which had received certification under the restraint reduction network training standards. And I think that's just something that the committee needs to be aware of when it's looking at the training which is being rolled, uh, which is currently in, in place in, in special schools. Can I, can I just ask you about the, the contact, if you've had it, with the special schools leadership group? We actually, uh, yes, I'll, I'll pick that. We, we are in, in the process. We have a member um, who's trying to set up a meeting with us um, with that group. We haven't actually um, had uh, contact with them at, at this stage. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, can I bring in Daniel McCrossan? Yes, uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentations. This is something that uh, we all feel uh, quite strongly about and uh, we recognise that there are issues. I've been lobbied uh, significantly in relation to this. Uh, people in my own constituency and beyond, Deidre Shakespeare to name one, Sean Cain to name another. Um, and I know that there's a huge amount of work going on in relation to the motion that's been come before the Assembly, which uh, we will be supporting. Um, I just have a number of questions. Um, um, is there guidance for schools being used in other jurisdictions which could be a template for standardised school guidance here? Um, just to touch, to touch on the, the guidance that I was citing earlier, um, Daniel, is the, the guidance which is um, it's produced by the UK government, but it's, it's for England, as I understand, just England. Um, and it's, uh, it's sort of cross-departmental guidance because it covers special schools, and healthcare settings, so it's both Department for Education and Department um, for Health guidance. So that is guidance that could be looked to as a template, but as I mentioned earlier, it does have a number of shortcomings, most notably the fact that it's non-statutory, that it also doesn't apply in mainstream schools for, for kids that are in mainstream schools that have special educational needs. Um, I mentioned earlier that I think it, it puts too much um, emphasis on professional judgment and um, to decide the situations in which restraints should be used. I think there needs to be a really clearly defined list of examples of when restraint can be used, you know, so that it's, it's understood that this really ought to be an absolute last resort option. Um, and finally, that it, it places too much responsibility on teachers to stay abreast of developments in terms of good practice. I think if you're going if, to ensure we have good practice um, uniformly across schools in Northern Ireland, the Department for Education and Education Authority need to take the lead in actually keeping staff up to date and ensuring training is not just a one-off event. And this is a big issue because if staff are going to be adequately trained, it's going to be a big resourcing issue. Um, it's another thing for teachers um, to take on. It's an absolutely vital thing that teachers do take on. But, you know, we'll say from the professional body for social workers, we know that social workers are massively overburdened with their workload. We campaign in relation to reducing bureaucracy that social workers can actually get on with the work that they are trained to do in terms of supporting service users. And I would draw a comparison with that on teaching staff. Teaching staff need to be adequately resourced. They need to be freed up if they're going to get training and they need to be supported. Um, because for you know, I can't, I can't imagine a scenario where any teacher goes into school in the morning and thinks, I want to restrain or to feed children. It, 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 it's not why individuals going, go into teaching. Um, teachers need to be resourced to provide an atmosphere and an environment where kids are supported, where kids are enabled, um, sort of a, need, a needs-based approach where children are able to um, ensure that their needs are met. Um, and I, just coming back, you mentioned being lobbied by parents. There are a number of parents that have, have been you know, incredibly articulate and vocal in terms of um, this issue. Carolyn mentioned in terms of the Department for Education and the advisory group. It's very important that there's parent representation in that group. But the approach we are advocating needs to go beyond that. If we're talking about positive behaviour support, part of positive behaviour support is an empowerment of the child or young person. And when they develop, when a, when a support plan is developed for that child or young person, it needs to be developed, not just by the teaching staff, but it needs to be developed in co collaboration, cooperation with the child or young person and also with the child or young person's parent or guardian. So in terms of parents, they have a role which comes right through this whole process. It's not a case that um, we only want to see parents shaping the guidance. We want to see parents actively involved in shaping the positive behaviour support plans that their children um, have developed for them. 
Yeah, you, you touched on a very critical point because I, whilst I agree with everything you, you've said, uh, uh, in reality and making that workable uh, is an entirely separate issue. Uh, we could train teachers very well, but the resourcing is a, a, a factor. Uh, we could have some of the, the best trained teachers uh, in the country, uh, but uh, that, that uh, in turn without necessary resource to back up the situation in the classroom uh, proves uh, to be very difficult. So I, th I think that the issue here is that whilst training is absolutely essential and we have full support of that, and I would like to see it mandatory, uh, 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 in fact, um, the issue is in relation to resources to enable the teacher to uh, make use of that training when a particular circumstance arises uh, 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 and then the need to have someone else in the classroom, I suppose, for the, the remaining, say, 29 children. So th th there's issues in that regard. There are, and I suppose that the, the counter to that argument, Daniel, is that the whole focus of a positive behaviour support approach, which is trauma-informed, which is needs-based, it's, it focuses on the reduction of incidents of um, behaviours which challenge. You know, it's, it's not a case simply that this is a, a different way of handling challenging behaviour. It's a way of, of essentially trying to avoid yeah. incidents arising where restraint or seclusion would otherwise be, be used. Yeah. So it's resource intensive, but the resources are at the entirely other end of the process. They're not resources which are focused on dealing with a crisis. They're resources which are focused on preventing a crisis arising. And with that in mind, that's going to improve the situation, not only for the children that are involved, but for all the other children in the classroom and for the teacher themselves, because you won't have a situation where you have these traumatic experiences occurring as frequently. It's really about avoiding the occurrence of those scenarios. Yeah, so, so that, that touches on a question that I had in relation to how you would see it operating in a classroom where there's 30 children uh, or one classroom system only to support a child uh, that finds themselves in that circumstance. So you, you've touched on that very well. Uh, do, do you believe that all school staff uh, will need special training? I think any, Karen touched on this earlier, but any, any school staff that have a direct engagement with children I think should be trained, yes. Um, now, it's, it needs to be borne in mind that not every child in a special educational setting is going to be a child, a child who, who, dis, um, pardon me, who demonstrates behaviours that are considered challenging. You know, there'll be many, many children um, in special educational contexts that won't require a positive behaviour support plan. So it's not, it's not a case for saying this is a blanket approach for every child. And I think in any context, taking a blanket approach is the wrong approach because every approach that uh, every every positive behavior support plan which is introduced for a child in northern ireland needs to be tailored to meet that child's individual needs because you know it's entirely wrong to think and i'm not suggesting i'm not suggesting for a second that this is the is, is, is where you're coming from but you know, some would come from the notion that every child with a learning disability um is the same child you know they're entirely different individuals they have entirely different needs um there will be a commonality at times but every positive behavior support plan that's put in place needs to be tailored to the needs of the individual child you know a child who has um, an autism spectrum disorder their needs may differ significantly for example from a child who has down syndrome for example um so it needs to be uh individually tailored and specific yeah, so so in practical terms and chair just indulge me slightly so i'm just trying to get my head around this so in practical terms if a teacher is fully trained in the front of a classroom with 30 children and th there's an issue that arises, then there's a problem and the problem presents then that the teacher's attention must divert to that particular child. What, what happens for the other 29 children? Uh, so so uh, all of this is very important and there is a very serious issue that does need to be addressed and, uh, and I fully recognise that. But we can talk about all the great plans but unless there's necessary resources to back those plans up, this is unworkable and it, it would actually add further pressure and stress to teachers who, in a, in a very diverse society, uh, uh, and, 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 and where we're having more and more uh, children with special educational needs in mainstream schools, we're, we're seeing uh, those challenges uh, compounded uh, each and every day and the stress on teachers. So teachers have, in effect, uh, in many instances, become social workers. Now, they've adapted and they change, and that's what teachers do. But I'm just saying in practical terms, what, what, how, how can this be workable without resource? You know, training is essential and necessary and very important, uh, 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 and, and uh, I'm in full support of it. But in a, in a, on a normal day, 30 children, one child has an issue, the teacher's attention diverts that child. What happens? I don't think it's. I don't think it would be beyond our competence now to start trying to develop. You know what the positive behaviour support plan would need to be. You would need to think in in terms of what who that child is, what their needs are. 
Um, but I think you're, you're kind of answering the question by saying, you know, without resource, how is this going to be addressed? I think my response to that would be, we need resources to address this problem. Yeah. You know, and I think the other the, the other point would be if, 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 you look, if you look, oh, no, okay. The other thing is, you know, if you look at the Scottish situation, um, I think when I came to this at first, my maybe naive understanding was that the Scottish government produced this guidance because they were super duper progressive. The Scottish government produced this guidance because they were their hand was forced by a judicial review supported by the Scottish Equality and Human Rights um, Commission. It could well be a case that in Northern Ireland a similar situation arises. Um, my recommendation would be that the department and the minister, you know, get ahead of this um, before it could become uh, an issue that has to be addressed rather than an issue that they can voluntarily address. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, you, you, you've, you've, answered, you've said what I wanted you to say. Uh, resources oh, are okay. essential. I got, I got there, I got there <laughs> yeah. No, thanks very much. And, and just, just from a personal experience, uh, I'm a, a, an uncle of a, a five-year-old uh, nonverbal child, and, and I see the huge... Uh, uh, challenges in, in, in terms of support that my sister and, and her family go through in trying to get that child the support uh, that he so desperately needs at times. And, uh, and I also recognise fully the, the, the work of, of, of schools in those circumstances. But it has been compounded by COVID, and I just want to put that firmly on uh, the record. But I appreciate what you've said. I think resources is key. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Can I, I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Andy and Carlin, for your update today. This is all new to me as well. It's actually only my second week on the Education Committee. Um, so it's really interesting to hear all, all of this. And it definitely is um, obviously so important. And I can only imagine what parents and children go through, um, you know, who experience this. Just, um, Andy, on your last point there about the Scottish Government and um, their approach, like... Um, the approach was taken around the human rights to the child. Can you advise um, of the human and children's rights impacts of the current departmental position on this issue here? Yeah, sorry. Mem members, can I just reiterate the need for anyone who is not speaking to be on mute? And it's it's Carolyn. It, no, it, it is okay. Um, Carolyn, I think it might be a bit of interference. Um, well, for you as well there. So um, that seems to be it now, though. Nic Nicola, do you want to just uh, reiterate that final point of your question there? Yeah, so just basically what you were discussing there about the Scottish Government and how that affected human rights of the child. Um, can you advise on the human rights and children's rights, the impact of that on from the current departmental position here on this issue? Okay, yeah, you guys pick that up, okay? Yes, yeah, okay. I didn't have any problem at all. Okay. Um, Thank you very much for the question, Nicola. In terms of in terms of the existing situation in Northern Ireland, um, I don't know if we can speak directly to how the, the how that sits um, in relation to various different human rights legislation and, and, and international treaties. Um, but I would point that the the Scottish um, Children and Young People's Commissioner's report in this place it highlighted shortcomings in relation to the universal sorry the U UN. Um, uh, Convention on Rights of the Child, the UN Convention on Rights with people, dis people with Disabilities, and also the European Convention on Human Rights. I'm sorry, just my, my little boy who's about to go out to nursery just walked past the window and distracted me there. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is working from home at the moment, isn't it? Um, I would recommend in relation to that, we're not experts in relation to human rights um, issues. I know that the Children's Law Centre, um, they, are, um, they, they, they work on issues in relation to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission will be able to speak to issues in relation to the Euro European Convention on Human Rights. And I think to have a really detailed assessment of how the situation in Northern Ireland in relation to the, the guidance or lack of guidance um, intersects with human rights um, law, I think it would be worth reaching out to one of those organisations that could speak um, with a lot more competence. The, the only issue I would say, and this is an interesting one, that there's, there's, there's four significant documents um, which are the Department for Education's documents, um, well, one which goes back to 1998. So there is a 1998 circular which is on promoting and sustaining good behaviour in schools, a 99 circular which is pastoral care guidance on the use of reasonable force to restrain or control pupils, 2001 um, document pastoral care in schools promoting positive behaviour, and then the 2004 regional policy framework on the use of reasonable force and safe handling. And when I was reading through that, because that's a document I only came to be aware of quite recently, 
It requires that all incidents involving the use of reasonable force must be recorded in the school's agreed pro forma. Um, and then that the school's principal will keep an accurate, up-to-date record of all such incidents. Um, and that um, immediately after an incident, um, there will be engagement with families to, 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 to ensure they're kept up to date. Now, that doesn't seem to be happening. Now, I, I, the issue being with the issue of restraint and seclusion is that restraint... All the, document, all, the, all the guidance from the department focuses on the use of reasonable force in a disciplinary context. Restraint and seclusion shouldn't ever be used uh, in, in a punitive or disciplinary way. But that's a, I, th- I don't quite understand why um, where restraint is being used that under that 2004 regional policy framework that um, parents aren't being informed that it's happening. Um, just to, it says, I think, just to look at it explicitly, um, parents' carers should be contacted as soon as possible and the incident explained to them. Um, there must also be recorded in the record report of the use of reasonable force as defined in the school's policy. Um, so that's just something that I don't think has been covered yet. Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree with you there, Andy. You'd imagine that that would be kind of the first protocol after an incident. Is, um, is that mandatory then as part of the, the whatever that recommendation was made, 2004, do you say? Um, well, it's yeah. The regional policy framework that that's, that applies across um, schools in Northern Ireland. So, I, I in terms of whether it's you know, I don't think it's just a statutory um, uh, guidance, but whether or not in terms of being mandatory, I, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. that's I'm trying to. I'm trying to unmute there. Sorry, I think I was muted and unmuted. Uh, I think my understanding is that it, it, it's it's not on statutes, it's not in legislation. It is there as guidance under a departmental circular. So it, it wouldn't be my understanding that it is um, required under law. But again, that, that those are interesting questions to ask. And I think... I mean, Andy has referenced there the need to, I think, to link in with the Human Rights Commission. I mean, there are very clear um, human rights um, uh, set out in terms of the, the govern kind of the practice around this and principles um, of human rights. I mean, absolutely, we will be advocating, as I'm sure many others would, uh, will inform all the work that the department are taking forward in this. So, you know, Article 3 rights in terms of um, you know, freedom to be uh, free from uh, treatment or punishment, which is inhumane or degrading, absolutely speaks to uh, to the relevance of this issue. Right to liberty and security, Article 5. Uh, Article 8, right to respect for private and family life and to the prohibition of discrimination um, as, as a disabled person. So there's very fundamental rights there that would be applied and we would absolutely um, be advocating that those principles uh, inform all of the work that the department are, are leading in, in this regard. Um, I think also would be useful for um, committee to consider um, uh, speaking with the, the, the Children's Commissioner in terms of some feedback in relation to the work that's that's happening there in relation to this issue, because I would imagine they will also take a very human rights-based approach to that. Okay. That's great. Um, thank both of you for those answers. Thanks, Thanks, Nicola. Thank you. Uh, Justin McNulty? Chair, good evening, I'm Chair. Okay. Justin? Sure, thank you. Can you hear me there? Am I, am I unmuted? No, that's, that's you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for your important um, work in this field. And like Daniel, I've been in touch with the Sean O'Keefe and Deirdre Shakespeare, two great champions, two great advocates for this uh, the, the, the concerns we're discussing today um, is the Association of Social Workers taking a position to inform and shape guidance and legislation with the Department of Education? Uh, uh, just in, the, in terms of we, we have as a committee, um, yes, I've produced a, a paper and we are very keen, we've expressed to the department um, or, or um, willingness to be involved in, in, in consulting and shaping the work that, they, that we do. We, we, we don't have the, the, the power or the authority, unfortunately, Jason, to, to set um, what the government policy will be, but we would certainly be uh, hoping to be part of one of the many stakeholders who will influence the work that the department are taking forward. Okay. Um, anything further, Ronnie? Um, I would just really focus, thank you, Justin, really focus on learning from the the context elsewhere. 
the English guidance, which I've said, is a, is a start, starting point from which the department can work from, but I think it needs to be vastly improved upon. I would also just point out that in relation to um, other countries, I know that New Zealand have um, legislated to prohibit the use of seclusion um, completely, and I think that's definitely an interesting, interesting example to be looking at as well. When the Scottish guidance does become um, available, which I presume will be hopefully early next year, I know it's been delayed because of COVID, that will also be a really useful template for the Department for Education to be working from. Um, but I think it's always important that we're striving for the highest standards, that we're not seeking to um, simply copy what's happened elsewhere if it can be approved upon. I think we should be looking at what's happened elsewhere and always thinking, how can this be improved to make sure that the children and young people in, in the education system have their needs met um, to, the, to the best standards. Okay, thanks, Andy. In terms of what, what is uh, the Association of Social Workers' role in safeguarding children with special educational needs? As there are there are safeguarding gaps that do need closed. Uh, you've talked about social workers in health and education. Who do who does the responsibility actually lay with when parents do raise concerns? Uh, well, as we mentioned, Justin, in in our original brief, I mean, social workers um, have lead responsibility in terms of. Um, safeguarding concerns and certainly um, we, we note uh, in previous um, reports that there's been some criticism around the uh, the communication between um, education authorities and, and uh, social health and social care and certainly um, in, in terms of um, speaking with the department we, we did ask um, and were given assurance that there would be representatives uh, in the, the groups going forward um, from uh, social work um, as an agency with lead responsibility. Um, so, I mean, what we've, what we've said is that, yeah, absolutely, all the parties involved, if there are safeguarding concerns, that would clearly sit with social work. Um, and social work would, would take the lead in that alongside uh, under drug protocols with the police if required. Um, and so those procedures are very clearly set out in the, the regional child protection um, guidelines, which all authorities have a responsibility to, to comply with. Um, what we have said is that going forward, we think, you know, there needs to be a, a really um, open discussion around uh, with parents, uh, with young people, with the, the various stakeholders in terms of developing guidance around how to manage complaints when they first arise uh, and try and resolve those issues. But if there are clear um, child safeguarding concerns, then absolutely that uh, responsibility lies with um, with social work. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Ireland, in terms of um, the training, can any training uh, that's proposed be um, incorporated into the already agreed ASD training in order to cut down costs? Again, I think, Jason, I mean, those are questions, I suppose, that in, in some way will we'll have to go to the department. Um, what, what we're doing is, is making recommendations around what best practice would be and, and giving our view in terms of uh, how things should develop. In terms of the practicalities of, of how that's agreed, that, that will involve, no doubt, complicated uh, conversations around, um, you know, time available, uh, release from time. I mean, Andy uh, and various members have already discussed the need and the implications there will be in terms of resources for this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if there's to be a, a whole scale um, new education program, that will undoubtedly have implications and, and will need to be um, agreed uh, in terms of how that would be ruled out. Okay, I know, I know your, your terminology um, about all behaviour being uh, communication and positive behaviour support strategies. Is conflict management an appropriate term to use when you're dealing with uh, children with special educational needs? Was that, Justin, sorry, was that conflict, conflict management? Is that appropriate? I don't think it is an appropriate term. It's not one that we've used. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of positive behaviour support, there's a, there's a really tremendous organisation called the Challenging Behaviour Foundation. They've done some really, really interesting research looking at use of restraint in the region um, across the UK. And they have some really, really useful guidance in terms of what positive behaviour support interventions look like. None of this is you know, really kind of difficult stuff. It's, it's a lot of it. It's very, very obvious. Uh, I'll, I'll just take you through one example. You know, so Challenging Behaviour Foundation, they'll say that positive behaviour support interventions, they need to be informed by a functional assessment to determine the reason for an individual's behaviour. So 
once you've determined the reasons behind an individual's behavior, factors can be altered to reduce that challenge of behavior. So, for example, if elements of a child's environment can be changed, noise levels in the context of somebody with heightened sensory awareness, or if a child can be taught new skills, if a child is nonverbal, for example, and if a child had thrown a plate at the end of a meal to communicate that they had finished, it'd be a case of teaching that child to sign, I'm finished. Now, this results in a more effective and a more acceptable behavior, um, but it also benefits the emotional well-being of the child. Because in contrast, if you look at what's a restrictive response to those behaviors, to shout at a child who's a heightened sensory awareness um, or place them in seclusion for throwing a plate, you, if, if you have a child who's biting and you strain them to stop them from biting, this just... Um, it can, it can traumatize the child, but it can also reinforce the behavior that, that's already there because the child's not being given an alternative way to communicate. So it's about addressing the, ad addressing the need, um, in, enabling the child to communicate if that is what um, uh, the problem is uh, at the root of the situation. Okay, last question, guys. So how will documentation be managed and regulated? Will it be at school level or EA or departmental level? I think... Oh, sorry, Karen. Go ahead, I'm doing you okay. We call for guidance, and um, the, the, the department needs to produce guidance uh, in, in, in relation to the use of uh, guidance aimed at reducing the use of restraint and, and, and preventing the use of seclusion. So there needs to be departmental guidance. But in terms of reporting, I think it's really important that reporting is done. It's done consistent, consistently across schools, so that when if there is an incident where restraint has to be used that then a report is provided to the parents so the parents are aware and then there's a follow-up so there can be a discussion as to how the incident occurred and what's going to be done, vitally what's going to be done to prevent those sorts of incidents occurring again in the future. That's really important so individual parents are aware of what's happening to their child. But what's absolutely vital, so you've got a, a good idea of what's happening across the whole sector, is that those reports go to the school's board of governors, but they also go to the children's commissioner we've proposed and to the education authority so that there's an, an understanding of how many incidents are happening because this is a big big problem at the moment is because there is no mandatory reporting we're aware of isolated incidents we don't know how frequently they're happening so we know from the parents that have been very vocal and campaigned we know their their situations but we don't know where um, incidents are happening and either they're unknown to parents or they're known to parents, but they're just not being they're, they're not being collected centrally. So we need to have that central collation of all incidents of where restraint or seclusion is used, so that we can have a really good understanding of the scope of the problem. Okay, Andy and Carol, I think Carol has just dropped off. Thank you very much for your contributions today. I commend your expertise and I commend your commitment. So well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. And um, finally, is Morris Bradley there? Morris, he was there. <laughs> what happened? There he is. Um, um, yeah, yeah, there you are. Sorry, Sorry Chair. chair. Uh, just not so much a, a, a question. Of, uh, you know, what medical background do the BSAW have to 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 make these recommendations to teachers? Um, I, th I suppose I'll feel that because Carolyn's not here. We don't. We, we represent social workers, Morris, and, and, and in relation to the issues, the social workers have a key role in safeguarding the, the well-being of children and young people, and that is not a medical issue. That's a social issue. That's about preventing harm. So you don't need to have an understanding of medicine to be able to say what is appropriate and inappropriate in the use of restraint and seclusion in, in terms of a child or young person's um, emotional and physical well-being. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I'm concerned that you have had no uh, feedback yet from the unions, nor have you had any engagement from the special schools. That, that, that's a big concern of mine, that we're actually here in this presentation without having their thoughts conveyed to you or us as a committee. I, I appreciate that, and, and it, it, this is a process. You know, we're working with the department. The next, we are planning to engage with um, the special educational sector. It's it's regrettable to me that having reached out to the unions back in September, that the unions didn't um, take up our offer to meet with them to discuss this issue because they will have issues with this. We know that we're putting um, extra demands on their members, and I think we are a member organisation, so we saw that as entirely appropriate from one professional body well, from a professional body to a, to a trade union that we would reach out and, and offer those meetings in the first place. 
unfortunately they didn't get back to us. I would love to be able to come to committee today and said we've sat down with the five unions and discussed this issue. It's not for, for want of us trying. But you've also had no engagement with the, the, the special needs headmasters and no, no, and that's something we plan to do. I would, I would just stress that when I, I understand this is an entirely, entirely legitimate um, concern to raise. We are a membership body, and we're informed by the views of our members. Now, social workers will be working across Northern Ireland. I mentioned many in schools; they will have knowledge of these issues and will have engaged with um, special educational sector. So, we have had those views fed through to us um, from our members that are, are working at the core face essentially on this issue. Mm. It, it just uh, one final. Comment, really, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. I, I have had feedback from, from parents in my constituency who would recommend an overhaul and uh, a looking branch review of the social worker system. And yet, you are asking us to take on board that you see a, a need for review uh, uh, in, in special schools uh, and, and secondary schools and primary schools. <laughs> Hi there, folks. I'm just back in. Can can you hear me again? Yes. Yes. Morris, Sorry, my Morris. internet connection has gone. Okay. Uh, so I've just come back in, and Morris picked up. Uh, I think on your last question there, um, and I think if I'm right, it was in relation to um, some concern that we're ma- we're asking for a written branch review of a of, of the education system and not the social work system. Am I right? Well, you're you're at, yeah yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I suppose. I mean, we we I suppose we said initially uh, in our, in our initial presentation, the reason we we got involved in this initially was because um, some parents who'd had direct experience made contact with with one of our members um, who'd been involved in uh, writing the document uh, three steps to positive practice around restrictive practices. So it was uh, it was a, a parent who brought the issue to us. Uh, and asked us to look at, I suppose, in relation to um, social work response and to human rights issues. Um, that's the approach that we've taken. We are not here to be uh, critical of our teaching colleagues, um, nor to uh, uh, to say that they uh, are wholesale engaged in poor practice. That is absolutely not our position. And I think we've made that quite clear that we're very supportive of the teaching profession, recognising the extreme challenges within which they work ordinarily. And let's highlight once again the, the, the even more extreme circumstances they've worked through COVID. So we are not here to be critical of them. We are not here to say that we think there is a, a tremendous level of poor practice. What we have done is look at this issue as social workers who have uh, knowledge and training in relation to uh, to children. We've looked at it from the children's point of view, and this has always been uh, about person-centered approach. Um, in, in our conversations that we've had, there has been very open engagement from the department that the, uh, the existing guidance is woefully outdated, and that was our starting point, that guidance that looks at approaches that is 25 years plus old um, and is, is no longer fit for practice. That is what we're calling for a review of. Um, EA and the Department uh, for Education have been very open to that, um, to that suggestion and indeed are themselves agreed that they want to look at that. What we're saying is that we, uh, we are not um, presenting ourselves as expert in teaching. We are saying as one professional group, uh, who need to be involved in this process, we want to be part of that. But absolutely, if the system is to be reviewed uh, and it is with the best interests of children at its heart and how children um, are developed, supported and nurtured, that that's the focus that every group will have um, in, that, uh, in that approach. And we are one part of that. We are by no means the only voice and we would absolutely encourage all uh, who have views and uh, a stake in this situation to be actively involved in that process. And responsibility to ensure that all those people are involved rests firmly with the department. I would still like to hear the response from the unions and the special needs providers, etc., and the schools before making any comment any, any further. Yeah, th- thanks that, Morrison. I, I think as uh, BSW and I have emphasised themselves that stakeholder engagement is absolutely key in relation to this and and as um, the the, uh, participants from BASW as well have acknowledged that obviously it has been an unprecedented 
challenging time for um, our our school sector in recent months. So hopefully that's an engagement that that can take place in in due course. Um, Andy, Carolyn, a, an extremely helpful presentation this morning. I'm really grateful for all the work that you are doing on this important matter and for all the work that will have gone into your your evidence to the committee here today. Um, we look forward to staying in touch with you on this important matter um, and, and to see uh, the outcomes uh, that we need to achieve put in place as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, members, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and add all members back into the spotlight and keep them there until the end of the meeting? Can I ask the clerk to summarise any actions uh, coming from that briefing? Thanks, Chairperson. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, if I've understood correctly, I think uh, the committee wants to write to the department just seeking the <coughs> terms of reference and the membership of the DE Working Group and Advisory Panel and perhaps encouraging the department to include parents, the teaching unions, and indeed the British Association of um, Social Workers um, onto, the, onto the panel. Um, perhaps also asking the department about the provision of accredited training for special schools uh, in respect of you know, challenging behaviour and the positive behaviour therapies uh, that have been mentioned. Um, also just um, perhaps asking the department what guidance and what jurisdiction, what, in what legislation and what jurisdiction they will be guided by in developing their own um, guidance for Northern Ireland and then perhaps asking them to confirm whether the recording of incidents of restrictive practice, seclusion or restraint is actually mandatory and how it is currently monitored. The department has indicated that in respect of this is a slightly different thing. Symptomatic children um, with COVID-19 being secluded, that is to be recorded, but it is not currently being recorded. Um, or the, 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 rather the department has no way of actually knowing um, how many children have been in that situation. Um, so those things. Additionally, then, um, Daniel had asked if uh, a question could be included about whether um, this review of um, uh, seclusion and uh, restraint, etc., would be uh, included as part of the SEN review and rollout. Additionally, then, perhaps members also want to write to the Human Rights Commission and just ask them about the human rights implications of the absence of guidance on um, restraint and seclusion, etc. Chairperson, anything missing there, members of chair? Uh, um, no, that's comprehensive, Clark. I'm just conscious that the Children's uh, Commission and NIPSO have undertaken work in this regard as well, and that perhaps um, in the, at, at a future date it would be useful to be uh, briefed by um, those organisations and perhaps organisations representing parents as well, but I think that's something that we can return to in due course. Members content with those suggested actions? Yeah. Okay, agreed. Okay, members then, can we move to agenda item 7, which is correspondence, and ask the clerk to speak to this item. So, Chairperson, um, there's quite a lot of correspondence. We have 18 items. Uh, a summary note is included from page 192. Uh, if I could ask members if they are content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note with the following exceptions. So there is quite a bit in here. At um, page 216, this is from the Minister indicating his intention to bring a paper to the Executive in relation to a three-year pilot scheme to address period poverty in schools. The pilot will cost two million, um, will apply to 10% of schools in year one, and then the idea being it'd be rolled out to all schools. Uh, the Minister is seeking an executive direction um, and, uh, as I said, estimated cost is uh, two million. So, uh, can I seek committee's agreement, Chairperson, to yeah, write? Uh, yeah, clerk, sorry, yeah, if I could, um, sorry, do you want to finish your action and then I'll just add to that? Well, no, it wasn't, wasn't yeah. much of an action, it was just right to the Minister, indicating the committee's support for the pilot and uh, forward to the homeless period who raised the issue with, I think, Deputy Chair. Yeah, just in, in addition, and... Um, in terms of what is being proposed, um, it, it seems regrettable that the word pilot is in there because I, I think it might actually be more extensive. Perhaps that's there for a, a formality and maybe we, we can address that and you know, further down the line. But um, the, the programme does appear to be a, a three-stranded programme that will take place over three years, as you say, Clark. We'll have an investment of two million pounds over those three years, and we'll have a, a, a three-stranded approach, as I say, 
one strand being ac improved access to period products in schools, um, second strand being improved menstrual health education and knowledge supported by SEA curriculum materials, um, and a third being uh, an aim to overcome any stigma attached to menstruation. So there, there appear to be positive proposals in place there. I, I'm not aware of an executive direction um, being commonplace, so we'll, we'll have to see what is involved in that. But um, there does seem to be some progress being made in terms of the rollout of access to period products in schools and improved um, menstrual health education in schools. I think we would maybe want to know a bit more of the detail in that regard. Um, and in addition to writing to emphasize our support for a an investment and program to provide free period products in all schools and enhanced um, education in schools, maybe take a, a briefing on this matter from the Department of Education as well. Karen, did you want to come in also? Yeah, I, I think there's already a pilot was carried out in eight schools in North Belfast. I don't see the need for another pilot. It's going to take three years. We agreed that it was an issue. We uh, and the department had agreed it. Um, I would like to see it rolled out in all schools from the beginning. Um, uh, but it may may take a bit of time, but I don't think it should take three years. Yeah, the, the, the cor correspondence alludes to difficulties um, passing the business case with the Department of Finance. So um, there, you know, there, there clearly are some challenges to overcome here. Um, I think it'd be useful to engage with the department on this, whether via informal meeting or, or formal um, briefing. I know our agenda is quite, um, it's quite heavily programmed. Do, do members want to have some consideration and maybe um, review um, what the difficulties were with the Department of Finance in relation to the business case before deciding whether we request an informal or a formal briefing in relation to the proposals? But in the meantime, okay, so uh, yeah, the, Justin. The, the SGLP has already launched a consultation into period poverty. It's our view that, that uh, period products should be available free across the north, not just in schools, because period poverty impacts more than school children. So we have launched that consultation. It's our, our intention to bring forward legislation in that, matter, in that regard in the coming uh, mandate. Yeah, that's right. Schools, colleges and public places, I think, is the um, proposed provision via that uh, PMB, Justin. Yeah. Obviously, our our remit is schools, and that's why we've been campaigning or supporting the campaign, I should say, for uh, the call for free uh, period product provision in all schools. And uh, Karen is right to note that the proposed programme does not achieve that in year one of the program. Um, and our, our position as a committee was clear to support free period product provision in all schools now. Yeah. Um, I, it, it, it feels like some progress is being made here mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't want to um, lose that progress. Um, as I said, the, the, just in the private members bill will proceed um, regardless, I imagine, of, of what we um, do on the committee um, 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 potentially even what the department does, um, because, as you said, it extends to public places, I think, as well. Um, but our remit is in schools. But remember, so I take from that that we that saying we support this program would not be an adequate um, reflection of the extent of our, of our position on free period product provision in all schools. Um, there, but um, in terms of what, an action to um, take that further, I think we would therefore need to engage with the department on this issue. I think we need to just decide yeah. whether we do that in an informal briefing, given the nature of our program for work program, or or a or a formal briefing. Do. Members have a view on that now, 
Do you want to request an informal briefing or do members want to have consideration whether that's an informal or a formal briefing? I'd be content with an informal. Or yeah. Right, I, I would imagine that could be facilitated quicker. Um, I think, Chair, I expect the department will want to come to the committee anyway in the new year to talk about budget matters. And if that's what the problem is, um, that there's a juncture, a segue for members to um, raise this issue um, again. Um, or not, or you can take it. I, I, I'm, I'm, it feels like some progress is being made, so I'm reluctant mm -hmm. to adopt a confrontational approach with the department on this occasion. Um, okay. And, and, but, and, and therefore we'd be content to take an informal briefing. Um, if that can be provided promptly, if it can't, then you know it defeats the purpose to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Can we can we in resp in, in that correspondence then um, absolutely forward this uh, correspondence to Homeless uh, Period Belfast and respond to the department to ask for a, a fuller briefing mm -hmm. on the matter informally, if that can if that means that it can be provided sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, otherwise, we would have to request a formal briefing. Members content with that approach? Content. Okay. Um, without prejudice to the private members bill, obviously, Justin. Okay. Okay. Next item, Clark. Moving on, then, the only other ones I wanted to pick out was at uh, page 431. Um, this is uh, a copy of a report uh, from an organisation calling itself Independent Sage, entitled Urgent Plan for Safer Schools. Uh, they've been before the Health Committee, uh, a number of their members, I think, on, a, on several occasions. Um, what they suggest, Chairperson, the committee might do is to forward that report to the department and ask it to comment. So it, it's about uh, an urgent plan for safer schools uh, to see if the department has any comments or the recommendations that are made therein. Yep. Yeah. That agree? Yep. Agree. It's agreed. Um, Clark, can I just check as well in terms of item 7.13? Page 348 corresponds from principal of Strandtown Primary School. Um, in Biden Robbins constituency of East Belfast regarding concerns about the special education needs framework, additional workload that personal learning plans place on teachers uh, and that due to COVID this framework uh, may not get the due consideration it deserves. Or uh, is the action to forward that correspondence to the department for response? I think the, um, the correspondent had uh, contacted us afterwards and um, okay. Uh, asked us not to do that. Okay, um, we can take a different approach with that. Yeah, then. That's just, okay. I think they just wanted the comments noted. They were thanking the committee for their for their hard work and their good questions that they'd asked about Fair this enough. In framework. Okay, no bother. Um, any other correspondence for a note? I hadn't had anything, members. If members are content, I know there's a lot in there, um, but if they're content with the uh, summary sheet, which is at page 192 to 195, okay. there's a ton. But members agreed? Agreed. Okay, members then, agenda item 8, forward work programme. Can I refer members to draft forward work programme at page 507? Uh, at next week's meeting, proceedings will have to conclude at noon. It is therefore suggested that the sports programme briefing be moved into early in the new year. Um, I think that's an unavoidable change, Clark. Yeah, um, our members uh, content to endorse the forward work programme as amended. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Okay, and can I ask members to confirm they will be able to attend Wednesday, the 6th of January 2021, for the effective questioning, training, and the committee planning session? Confirm. Okay, that's great. Okay, members, uh, agenda item nine is any other business? Uh, can I ask members if they're content with the uh, press release on the TIM survey? I'm content. If that reassures anyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll have to check it now that you're too content. I'm, I'm a quick glance there then. What page is that? It's in tabled items. I think it would be like about uh, page five or so. Tabled items. I think there's only two tabled items there, Justin. So, yep, tabled items, page eight. Oh, page eight, sorry. It, it, it's, yeah. it's to recognise the achievement and to suggest that a uh, longitudinal, longitudinal analysis tracking progress from primary through to post-primary would be uh, a useful addition as well. Yeah, content. Yeah, members content. Morris, Justin, you had a chance just to stand yeah. that there? That's great. Okay, members, thank you. Lovely. Then, any other business? 
No. No. Okay, so our date and time of next meeting is next Wednesday, the 16th of December, in room 29, Parham Buildings, at 9 a.m. And hopefully we will we will have a statement from the Education Minister at some point next week as well then, um, given the information that we still need. Okay, members, meeting does not adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Now in Assembly, Committee Room 30.